we bow to Devi Saraswati, the giver of boons and fulfiller of wishes. O Lordess, as we begin this auspicious day, please bestow on us the capacity of right understanding and intelligence. Let us hope that the light of education wipe out the darkness of injustice, aggression and division in society and lead us towards growth, liberty and equality. Now, may I request the dignitaries to please
Shrika Andani, welcome you to this wonderful event along with my co-host Shreya Sharma. Honorable Principal Sir, respected teachers and dignified guests present here, we are overwhelmed with your gracious presence. Netaji Subhash Chandra Bose stated that one individual may die for an idea, but that idea will, after his death, incarnate itself in a thousand lives. Vishwakabhi Rabindranath Tagore advocated the idea of global integrity and that the man himself is a gateway to the world. Nelson Mandela's idea on courage was that courage is not the absence of fear but to overcome it. Swami Vivekananda quoted the idea that education is not the amount of information that we put into your brain and runs riot there undigested all your life. We must have life building, man making and character making assimilation of ideas. Today we will be celebrating, remembering, acknowledging and admiring ideas. Let your ideas, thoughts give you inspiration. All creativity comes from your imagination. You first imagine, then you create. This second edition of TEDx Youth at BVB Raipur is curated by Bhartya Vidya Bhavan's RK Sarda Vidya Mandir and Skillsphere. TEDx was created in the spirit of TED's mission, ideas worth spreading. It supports independent organizers who want to create a TED-like event in their own community. It is said that everything begins with an idea. TEDx is the origin of thoughts, the dawn of innovation. It is a library of speakers presenting to audiences about everything from politics to pollination. So it is the sea of ideas that we are going to explore today. TED started out small. In 1984, architect and designer Richard Saul Verman and his colleague Broadcast designer Harry Marx created the first TED Talk for a small audience in California. Unlike today's TED conferences, in which talks are carefully scripted and rehearsed, there were no speeches. Verman's original vision for TED was to create the anti conference, no boring PowerPoint slides and one hour lecture. It is technology, entertainment and design. TEDx is loved by adults, college students, and even children. There is always something for everyone. TEDx is a non-profit institution that partners with individuals to assist in sharing ideas globally. Today, TEDx boasts a collection of over 3,000 TEDx Talks videos from politicians to scientists to comedians and actors. TEDx Talks India originally known as Tech Talks India Nai Soch and also known as Tech Talks India Nai Bath, is an Indian talk show hosted by Mr. Shah Rukh Khan that premiered on Star Plus. The slogan of the show is Don't Kill Ideas. Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan's RK Sada Vidya Mandir is proud enough to conduct the second episode of TEDx Talk here in Raipur. So let's dive into the world of ideas, thoughts, and power. The world is full of diamonds and gems and we are having some of them here today to build this event. With this note, I would like to give my heartiest welcome to our first speaker, Arna Jain. 
She is a 12th grader studying in Bhavan R.K. Sarda Vidya Mandir, Raipur. Arna has been always a bright student since the beginning. She is no doubt charismatic who is always in for new experiences and adventures. She believes that she has an ability to form and change opinions. She possesses leadership quality as in rich in various skills. Arna, a good debater, has also represented herself in Bharat Natyam on international level. Besides all this, Arna Jain is a sports enthusiast too. She is a basketball player and swimmer. At present, she is the content writer for ETF in Chapter India. Exams are round the corner and most of us are stressed out. But remember, marks are not the only parameter to measure a person's ability. This is what Arna is going to speak today. So, here are some ideas that will lead down new paths and joy and learn. Greetings everyone. How many of you think that marks are the only parameter to measure a person's ability? Some of you do accept the fact I see, but I hold a different opinion. This strong opinion can be related to a race. On your marks, get set, go. But why do I look so confused? Because this is not an actual race that we are starting, but a race that continues for a lifetime. A race that determines your worth in the society. Yes, an unrealistic race of achieving the highest marks in every exam of your life. Long ago, exams were devised to give the teacher a measure of how effective the teaching has been. But now, it has evolved to a stage where everyone, parents, teachers, students and management, use it to judge the capability of a student. In today's era, marks are considered as the superior most parameter to analyze a student's success in the future. But is it the only thing that makes sense? From the examination point of view, it does not show the intelligence of a person, but the remembrance and recollecting ability of a student. These skills are vital, but are they sufficient? This is the 21st century where organizations prioritize multidimensional people. Gone are the days when class 12th mark sheet was the only deciding factor of our future endeavors. Development of mindset, widening of personality and a positive attitude is what the world craves. A person might not remember your marks, but will definitely remember how you treated them. From my personal experience, I have been into extracurricular activities as much as I like studying. At the age of five, I was forced to join karate classes. Being a lazy kid, I never showed any interest in getting my body to grind. I regularly attended those classes for seven years till I finally developed some interest into what I was doing. The very next year, when I was a seventh grader, I was compelled to sacrifice my passion for complete concentration into studying. Being absolutely unaware of what this meant, I reluctantly diverted my mind. This was the start of a realization process of how taking a stand for myself could imbibe a necessary life skill. How a physical activity positively impacted all the other spheres of my life. It gave me a temporary refuge from the unrealistic expectations of the society, increased my concentration level, and most importantly, taught me discipline in life. One important learning that would forever stay with me is, time invested is never wasted.
This also meant that putting all of my focus and efforts into academics instead of my passion had a negative impact on my mental health. I began having unreasonably high expectations from myself and I, when I was unable to fulfill some of them, I began to question my abilities. Although I continued to receive outstanding grades, did I feel fulfilled? No. Did I feel good about the outcome? No. I was only able to succeed in this after giving up absolutely everything that made me happy. Our Honorable Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, was bombarded with questions related to the burden faced by students due to the rising expectations of their parents. In one of his Pariksha Picharcha 2020 interviews, he beautifully mentioned that examinations are important stepping stones of our lives, but they do not define our entire lives. Constant pressures from our parents makes us believe that a person can only be successful if they attain high scores, which is far from reality. I believe that a person can be successful if they have a blend of soft skills and proper timing. What one can start doing is to try to expand their circle. Good connections help a lot in life. Try developing a skill set which makes you more valuable. Since we have started an important discussion, let us get into the topic of soft skill development. A, a study conducted by the Harvard University states that as much as 80% of the achievements in an individual's career are determined by soft skills and only 20% by hard skills. The question is, what is included in soft skill? These are the practical skills such as leadership, time management, communication and listening that assist a person in the real world. I personally believe that investing time into these activities will reap you more in life. Academics is extremely important, but soft skills are equally important. A perfect blend for, of these two will help you in being successful. Let us take an example of a scientist. He has some marvelous ideas that the world would have never heard about. Lack of soft skills such as experiences, communication and projection will confine those ideas amongst the four walls of his laboratory. The external world would never get to witness those amazing ideas. Now let us understand the end of the race that we spoke about earlier. Starting the race was not in your hands, but ending it on a beautiful note is completely controlled by you. This race called life is a journey and marks should not be the only co-passenger to your final destination. Soft skills and memorable experiences can prove to be great companions along the way. Enjoying this journey every day by improvising and enriching yourself instead of the sole motive of reaching your final destination will make this journey worth living. Getting marks is perfect, but I believe in being imperfect enough to live life on my own terms. So now, on your marks, you're all set, it's time to go and explore. Thank you. Thank you, Arna. It is really such a relief to hear your ideas. It will definitely work for us. Now, May I call upon Principal Sir to bless Anna by presenting a memento. Thank you, Arna, and thank you, sir. Can I call Anand, sir, to the stage to have an interact interaction with Arna?
Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Arna, you have touched upon a very important area of learning that is extremely important not only for the TEDx forum or from the perspective of ideas worth spreading, but also for all of us who are seated here. Soft skills, something that your school, of course, pays a lot of attention to, but something that is not given the level of emphasis in most parts of our country and probably the world as well. All right? Talking about soft skills, Arna, I have a few questions. You touched upon many important aspects of soft skill development. You explained the difference between hard skills and soft skills to us. What I'd really like to know from you is which soft skill, in your opinion, is the most important one? Sir, I believe confidence and communication are two things that helped me a lot. All right, confidence and communication. And how do you think our friends who are seated here can develop these skills in a better manner? Practice is all you need. A constant practice, all, the, uh, all this time before the speech, the practice is what made us all confident. At the start, we all fumbled. We did not learn the speech properly. or We were very underconfident. Uh, under but due to constant practice, that is what made us uh, overcome it. All right, great. And how do you believe this TEDx platform is going to transform you as a person and your life? Sir, it, as I spoke, soft skills such as confidence and communication. Firstly, the process of making that script, transforming the ideas, putting them into paper and then in, uh, into my speech, it really helped me a lot. And then practicing it here, speaking it and uh, giving my ideas to everyone is what will help me. Thank you so much, Arna. Anything else that you'd like to tell your friends who are seated here and that will motivate them to become speakers like you? What I'll say is, go beyond your comfort zone. Don't lie there. You can always achieve more than you think. Thank you so much, Arna. Please give her a big round of applause. Well done, Arna. Thank you so much. Great achievement. All the best. Thank you, Anush, sir, and Arna. Acting is behaving truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Now, we have someone who fascinated us with his power of acting on Children's Day. A personality who doesn't need any introduction. Abhishek Patnayak left no stone unturned to enthrall us with his power of acting. His dramas reveal his thoughts and ideas. He is another intense artist. The 28-year-old Abhishek Patnayak is one of the co-founders at Out of the Box Production. He has been producing, directing, acting, and writing English and Hindi theater since the past eight years. His plays revolve around situational comedies. The role of a 52-year-old professor, Jagannath Mahapatro, in Two Adorable Losers, earned him a lot of popularity in the theater circuit, with a four-star rating from Bombay Times. His premier Hindi comedy, Last Over, starring Rakesh Bedi, also received a four-star rating from Bombay Times. He has directed and performed alongside theatre veterans like Rakesh Bedi, Anant Mahadevan, Darshil Safari, to name a few. Abhishek has currently written a new play, Kaise Karenge, the second urban Hindi production. He plays the role of a character that faces multiple personality disorder, hence playing three distinct personalities, a Haryanvi, as a Lucknowi poet, and a shy 27-year-old man. Besides theater, Abhishek, is, Abhishek has starred in television shows on Disney India's Best of Luck Nikki, The Sweet Life of Karan and Kabir, and Epic Channel's Yum Kisi Se Kam Nahi, as well as in ads for Flipkart. The role of the 52-year-old professor Jagannath Mahapatro and the role of Kapil Paras Rampuriya with dissociative identity disorder have won him several praises in the theater circuit. So, a big round of applause for this wonderful actor. Let's dive into the world of creativity and ideas. Good morning, everyone. You know, while I was just walking here, I had one question. How many of us have done a performance in their life? school, college. Don't answer it, just feel it. Because my whole, whole speech is about just my feel. How many times just before entering, 
you know, you feel that nervous energy. Some people are calm. Some people are trying to be focused. Some people are the experienced ones. They're like, I've done this many times. No. They are also equally nervous. They've just got the experience. That part, before coming on stage, and then after the performance is done. Oh, you were really good. Good, good, good show. Thank you, thank you. Oh, wow, that meeting went really well. Your presentation was amazing. Great. Before I forget, all the world's a stage and we are all actors. So for me, theater is not just stage. Stage could be anywhere. So just that feeling, that relief. Oh, thank God it happened. Did it happen well or not? That's not important. It's over. Now, what's most important is that in between part, when you were over there performing, what was that like? Ask yourself this question. It could be anything. It could be even in a classroom, you'll have just stood up and the teacher asked you to read something. It could be a poem you'll recited. A presentation in front of, you know, an entire uh, meeting where you'll have to really present something, a pitch to a sponsor probably. This is all a performance. When you all are there, I can take my personal example. When I'm performing on stage, that energy, there's a transfer that happens. That can never be matched. That nervous energy just transcends, and that is what I call the high of theater. And that high is my passion. And that passion, then I, I just crave for it. That two hours, one and a half hours, when I'm on stage, I just want to be in that high. There are many times after performance, I'm on my way back home in my car, and I'm thinking, wow, what was that? That feeling, I just want to be in that bliss. And the next moment, my mom will come. What time am I coming for dinner? I'm like, mom, I'm just coming. They break the eye. <laughs> but I just want to crave that. And that's when I decided that, OK, my passion is theater. I know that. I know that this gives me bliss. How can I continue striving? And how can I continue making a living out of it? This question did not come to me in the first few years of my life. It came a little later. Now, in the same breath, I've spoken about my passion, the high. Let me talk about the second aspect, perseverance. Any passion you'll take, I'm taking theater as my reference, you need to persevere. There has to be perseverance. Perseverance technically means a lot of people will discourage, a lot of difficulties will come, but you still continue and continue and continue. So in the same breath, if I have to say theater, uncertainty, instability, frustration, Negativity, these are the lows that one generally faces. I have faced that as well. Because that is what the platform is. That is what uh, theater is. There is a certain level of uncertainty, always. But my aim was always to reach that high. I want to go on stage. I want to go express. Oh God, how just before on stage, I'll be shaking. What do I do? Oh, the audience is there. Oh, will that guy laugh? Will that uncle laugh? Will that audience accept me? Oh, it doesn't matter. Talk on stage, expressed. And then after that, that bliss. So then my bio that reads, producer by chance, writer by choice, actor by profession. The last two are fine. The first one was the biggest mistake. <laughs> producer by chance. Which means no one was betting on me. So I bet on myself. And I said, I will produce plays. Because, you know, I didn't come from a family which had a, a theater background, totally alien to them. But I decided, no, no, I will do this. And I decided that, okay, in order to get that bliss, always be on stage and get that high, you need to sustain. Which means you need the mullah, you need money, you need sponsors. No one is going to invest. I didn't come from that kind of a background where, you know, someone will put money and just go have plays. So now, Cut to that, OK, I have to do it, keeping the my mindset that all the world's a stage. Now imagine a 21-year-old guy just come out of college in suit, um, in a, you know, formal shoes, sitting in front of a vice president of an organization and telling him that why he should put his money on my play. Now, little backstory: just graduated. So before that, life was like this, half pants, chappals. OK, t-shirt, collars up, because yeah, that's cool. No, it's not. Huh? Girls don't like that. So <laughs> avoid that. OK. 
that was a misconception I had that call us up for school, it's not. So anyway, I was over there and I was like, sir, this is the play and you need to put money and this is the money we need. He said, okay, uh, who are the actors? Uh, this is the actor, this is the actor, and this guy, Abhishek, is the actor. He looked, uh, you, as in you are acting in it. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm there. Oh, you are, you are only, you are pitching your play and you're acting in it. Yeah, sir. Ah, do some act. So now, I mean, I'm in a formal attire and I'm trying to give a full marketing, you know, presentation and everything. Yeah, just show me what, what is there. I was naive and who cares? I wanted to act. Not anki pana to rehta hi hai. So I said, okay, come. I did one act in front of him. He, he just looked at me. 30,000 rupees. Happy. 30,000 rupees. I cracked 30,000. Sponsor on board. Team is happy. Imagine now going for rehearsals. Remove the tie. Why? Okay, come on, everyone. Let's rehearse. I've got 30,000 rupees. Okay. Chalo. Everyone's rehearsing. Sab look, everything is going in order. We do the show. Now, little economics. 2 lakhs was the cost of the show. 30,000 was sponsorship money. 70,000 we got from ticket sales, which means 1 lakh we got as our revenue, which means we made a loss of 1 lakh, but we didn't care. 1 lakh was a loss, but we made 30,000 rupees through sponsorship. This is the mindset, okay? Because you have to understand, I'm an artist, but at the same time, I had to balance being a businessman also. That's why producer by chance. Um, this continued for a few years. Passion was at its place. Support of family was, of course, there. But um, it was not going anywhere. It was not like, a lot of people are like, Thik hai, iske aage kya, theater ke baad kya karoge? Um, job warp, uh, why don't you do TV a bit? I did that also. I did that, but that high, I was not getting what I get on stage. Was that enough? Is our passion enough? Do we need to give some purpose to it? Purpose meaning, yes, I want to express myself. Yes, I want to go out there and say theater sets me free. I've actually experienced these things. These, this is very common with theater people. But all theater artists, or rather most of the theater artists, I come in that category, we are not good businessmen or women. So now what happened is that I was like, fine, this few years that I've been struggling, ki I'm breaking even, I'm making losses, what do I do? How do I reinvent myself? How do I balance this, that artist by day, businessman by evening, sometimes businessman by day, artist by evening? I, I didn't know. I didn't know where to go, what to do. So in Mumbai, because I used to think Mumbai is where theater is, biggest misconception of my life, um, there are two areas. One is Juhu, one is Nariman Point. So as a youngster, I used to go and feel that, okay, I used to sit in that group. Chai is being passed everywhere. Theater to a kala hai, paisa nahi, it should just be done. And these guys are really talented, huh? these guys are really good. But they don't know how to, you know, sustain themselves with theater. I said, uh, good, two years I was in that zone, but I can't make a living with that, no. Then comes the other section where I went to Nariman Point. There, there's a family of four who are dressed in posh clothes, one posh car will be there, 1500 rupees a ticket. Ah, beta, harshush hai. Good, good, good play, good play. Okay, and they want a big set. They want uh, uh, beautiful glamour. They want some bedroom farcical comedy. No problem with that. Works wonders. There's an audience for that. But I was like, hey, this also I can't do. How do I? I'm saying I'm passionate about theater. I do English theater, Hindi theater. How do? What? How do I keep it going? So then, I decided. Something changed in my life. I said that, okay, if I'm following my passion, what do I want to tell people? I came up with one play. Uh, it's called Two Adorable Losers. And I used to feel my life is around Juhu and Nariman Point. I need acceptance from both sides. This is what I felt. I did the play. 20 shows we must have done. It started going houseful. Made little money, possibly. People from, oh, wow, what a play. Well, lighting was very good. This is the Juhu side. Nariman Pad, oh, God, my dad, so funny comedy. It was very good, beta, very good. All this was happening. But, and I thought life, this is, this is what theater is. This is how it's going to be. But how do I continue with it? Because I'm just stuck in this loop. 20 shows, 
I'm watching other people, they're doing 100 shows. I have got something where I got stuck. This is where I got stuck. I'm like, okay, now it's not going anywhere. Sponsors are coming in and they're fine. What do I do? How do I make a living out of it? How do I, you know, it, it was so, I, I couldn't express it, which I can't do it now also. I need, I need this to go out somewhere. What should I do? This is where I learned that my option Bs came in. My parents were like, do you want to do a job or something? Visualize myself, nine to five, going, standing for the bus or the cab, then going over there, working, no. Why don't you work for someone else? I thought, okay, imagine writing something for someone else, then I imagined how it would be like life over there with them, but that freedom, that, that it's mine, it's my baby, that didn't come. I said, no, that also doesn't happen. So how will you do it? How will you sustain? You need that. And literally uncertainty, people started leaving. I told them that, okay, this is a very uncertain field. I knew it myself. People who were working with me, they started leaving. Someone got married, he had to leave. Someone uh, realized that this is not his calling. He left, so people started branching out. But I did not, I said, no, this is what I want to do. And I can't keep just blabbering like that. I, this is what I want to do. What should I do out of it to basically sustain? Enter the part where I was doing a show and some dignitary came to watch it. He said, I loved your play. Do you want to do this in Musket? Uh-huh, what? Mumbai, all my life. Uh, Musket, I, Oman, like, yeah, why didn't you do an international show over there? I said, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, businessman is pathetic in me. How much will you charge? I quoted a pathetic amount. He looked at me as if I'm joking. Okay, good, come. And it was there, 2017, all the 11 years, I started off in 2011, the six years of struggles of breaking even, making money in TV, possibly trying to find my calling, what should I do? It was finally coming over here to this show which changed my perspective. I went there and there were actually a lot of renowned people who were performing. There were five plays and the organizer asked me, Abhishek, on a scale of one to 10, how funny is your play? you can't say these things, like, you know, you can't show off before it has happened, right? Let the audience come and tell you. So I was like, sir, it will be fine, it's good. No, you tell me how good is it? He kept doing this, I said, okay, sir, on a scale of 10, it's 11. Uh, sure. Okay, um, okay. And I remember that instance, we are performing Two Adorable Losers, and there was a section in the play where he started laughing, and his, he started coughing, and he choked. <laughs> they had to take him out. And I was like, sir, now you know how funny it is. <laughs> so uh, uh, that memory I always have, and he was very happy by the end of it. And he said that this was, out of my five plays, the best play. Uh, of course, it's always subjective, but he was being kind maybe, that okay, this guy has come and he's come with a young team. Uh, then I started realizing, oh, the market is not Mumbai. What if I start going to other places? What if I pick up that phone and start calling people up and telling them that I have this play? My biggest asset was that I'm young. I'm gonna have this play that is contemporary, relevant to today's times, okay? It's not a play where people will just be watching and drowse or you know, people will basically be like, kya dikha diya? No, they will connect with it. Itna, I had got this confidence through audience reciprocations. So, now cut to 2018, me picking up the phone, the businessman, okay, but I played a character. I said, okay, this phone I'm going to pick up, I'm going to talk to this individual, tell him that this is what my belief is, this is what I want to do, and I want you to be part of it. Can you imagine the person is not even looking at you? It's not even a face-to-face -face meeting. He could be in any part of India. He could be here, Raipur. He could be probably in Gwalior. He or she could be in Nainital. These are the calls that started happening. They started saying, okay, you come, and the performances started happening. And then I started realizing that, all right, now the, the dynamics have changed. It's like people come to Mumbai to pursue their dreams, but what if Mumbai is going outside to pursue his dreams? And I started meeting different people. Perception changed. Okay, my passion now is that, yes, I want to perform. Purpose, I want to spread theater. This is where my perseverance really helped. 
because had I given up in those moments, and they were terrible moments, uh, for anyone who's pursuing a passion, it is not always a fairy tale. I have done 11 years, 11 and a half now. Somewhere or the other, it's going to go low. It will. But the beauty is that how you ride along with it. It's easy say, easier said than done. When I was in that moment, it was not easy. It's only when it came out, it made sense. But I knew one thing. Uh, 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 great genius, Sadhguru, he has said this, that what you cannot do, that's fine. Okay, you cannot do. But what you can do and you do not do, that's a tragedy. This stuck. This just hit me. And I was like, yeah, I can do this. But if I stop doing it, then that's a tragedy for me. This passion that's there, this is for me. And by the end of it, we started performing. And primarily, my end note that I would like to give is that I was on stage once and someone asked me that uh, my introductions were going on. Someone said that theater makes you learn, um, TV makes you rich, films make you famous. Immediately after my performance, I said, no, this is what I'm going to change or try to change, that theater will make you learn, theater will make you rich, and theater will make you famous. With that, I would like to end that if you guys have your passion, persevere, and it will definitely bear some fruit with it. Thank you. Now may I request Principal Sir to present the memento to Mr. Abhishek Patnayak. Now may I request Anand sir to have an enlightening session with Mr. Patnayak. Thank you so much. Uh, Abhishek, I think just like most of your plays, uh, which uh, had these people in Oman and Muscat uh, gripped, you definitely had us gripped with your speech as well. Um, few questions that I really want to ask you, Abhishek. Um, you know, I come from the field of public speaking and I um, teach a lot of these children uh, how to express themselves on stage. And you do something very similar. And uh, I thought this would be a very pertinent question for them. Um, when we talk about those fears that people have in life, um, a lot of statistics suggest that the fear of being on stage, the fear of public speaking, is the second most widely seen fear after the fear of death. And uh, there are a few researchers who have said that the feeling that people have just before getting on stage is very similar to the feeling you have just before you die. <laughs> which is a very interesting thing for me to think about as well. But I want you to share your experiences of uh, dealing with that stress, that nervousness, that anxiety before coming on stage. What are the different things that you do? And I think that is probably going to eliminate the biggest, biggest obstacle that prevents a lot of children from coming on stage. So I'd love it if you share it on this platform. Sure. Uh, can I take a couple of minutes to answer Yeah, yeah, this? please take your time. You have, okay. you have them gripped, isn't it? <laughs> okay. Yeah? Did you like that speech, by the way? Yes or no? <laughs> great, great. Yeah, there so, are fans. Go ahead. Okay. So what happens is that I think it's an evolving thing. Imagine when I was young. So when I'm young, my teachers used to tell me I was doing oral communication and I had not done much drama till the 10th standard. So before coming on stage, I used to rehearse my part. I used to keep rehearsing and uh, in school what happens is that if you just talk freely and if you just talk confidently, it works. Oh wow, he's really good. You have a piece over there. So I can talk about that aspect where definitely there are people you know in an environment which is a closed environment and people are there to uh, groom you. Now comes the part when, like over here, I, I don't know many of the people here, but of course there's a connect, I had done a play, but individually, I, I don't know many of you all. So before I come on stage, before I go for any performance, in the beginning, so my legs would always move. Uh, there would be someone or the other, Are, mujhe dar lag hai. They would, I would hear them, Are, ye log kar rahe? and they would be doing sound alights. And I used to like, keep them away. 
So there should be a lot of nervousness. I didn't, you know, I didn't know what over, would take over. But the moment the lights would go out, act one would be read. So it's just the first one minute. You know, mouth tends to get dry many times. We are told in theater, mm, all this you need to do. I never did all this. It was just the first one minute. The first one minute that I've got it, either I used to feel that, okay, this audience is tough, so I'll deal with them in a different way. If this audience laughs at my first joke, there's, there's, there's an internal joke that happens that, oh, today Abhishek is going to thoda overdo it. Okay, in the, the sound person will say, Are, wo abhi gaya. because he knows the audience has, is there. The moment they are not there, that's the challenge where I feel that, okay, I need to get them. So before going on stage, some personal anecdotes, what I always do, uh, definitely character to character, if I have to play an older character, uh, the basic, everyone has taught you breathing exercises, uh, before you go, I'm moving nervously from one area to another area. I just learned one thing is that I used to tell my other co-actor, be in the moment, in the moment. I never understood what this means. What it technically means is, don't think of all the nonsense you have. Okay, what are the other people saying? What are you going to do after the performance? What happened in the morning? Did your mom shout at you? Did you have a fight with your girlfriend? Whatever you had, that is not important. This is the moment. Then that changed my perspective. Being in the moment and performing, that totally changed the ways. Now I deal with it in a different way. I was waiting here on stage. I was nervous, by the way. I had some water. I met Asma, Asman. He's like, I asked him, how are you feeling? He said, I'm, I'm fine. I'm like, I'm feeling nervous. You're fine. <laughs> He's coming next. <laughs> Sorry, I've hyped you up. So I said, uh, okay, I had some water. Took a deep breath. The moment the house lights went off, something takes over. There is something that happens which I can't explain. Uh, but my only advice would be, people will tell you 10 things. Take the best ones. And when you're expressing, that is where you will find your own groom. So for all the youngsters, definitely just be aware and in the moment is what I have found the answer to before you go on stage. Enjoy that moment also. Okay, I'm feeling nervous. I always use the restroom also before going on stage. It just happens, I don't know why. And I give a great performance after that. The day I have not, it's a bad performance. <laughs> great, great. So we'll make sure that uh, wherever we call Abhishek, there's a restroom, right? <laughs> All right. Uh, moving on, another question that I want to ask you, which I think is also very important, is we always talk about our best performances. We talk about, uh, you know, the times when we had the audience gripped. Could you share a little bit about your worst performance? with the audience and how it changed you as somebody who comes on stage? Oh, thank you for the question. <laughs> so, um, so I'll tell you how it has happened. One is my first performance, I can talk about that, and the other one I'll talk about recently in the past year. Um, the first time I did a show where my parents, everyone came, it was a house audience, meaning everyone, family, friends have come, went amazing. I thought this isn't easy. College, I was killing it. Yahan pe aur bhi easy, audience is laughing, gripped. Great. Next day was the second show. Random people have come on stage, okay, to witness your play. People, old uncles, old aunties, they have paid 500 rupees, 300 rupees for a ticket. No one is laughing. Everyone is looking like that. And I'm wondering what changed. My mouth started drying up, okay. And that performance, I started fumbling. Fumbling on stage means that kuch to gadbad hai. Okay, I, I, I couldn't act. In the interval, my director, who was an amateur himself that time, he comes and he's like, what are you doing? Give full energy. <coughs> he hasn't realized. Now when I reflect back, that what has just happened is that the people are not connecting with the play. It's a different play, but we are thinking that, oh, okay, this is bad. So my performance started deteriorating. I took it to my heart. I still take bad performances and worst performances to heart. Uh, what I generally do is, um, I try to end it that night itself. Generally, we have evening performances. That evening itself, I'll go, my team will be there. Unfortunately, fortunately, I'll always have people around because there are other people also who are with me. I'll have my dinner, I'll be thinking, I'll be thinking what went wrong, what should I have done, how should I have made it better, and then I'll sleep. The moment I've slept, maybe one or two days will stay, but then it goes away, but I've, I'll feel restless till the next performance doesn't happen. Because I'm in that mood that, okay, this performance has to go great. Now, this was my fault. That's a thing. Now let me tell you another way. I'm performing. Recently I was performing in um, Pilani. I had the audience in grip. Two minutes it was there. Thak lights burst. 
and the play had to stop. And I clenched my teeth. I was like, okay. My co-actors, well, Mike went off. Another thing. And I was like, this is not even my fault. This is, I'm not even, what did I do wrong? I was prepared for it. And I was like, now what should I do? And literally, that's the time you're being actually very honest. And, uh, you know, you want to cry out. You want to just be like, yeah, what is this? Why, why is this nonsense is happening? Everyone uh, was looking. Audience is also now like, Are, okay, how is he reacting? Itna to they gave an introduction for him. How will he now re cope up with that? I tried my best. Then in the wings, they called me. They shut the curtains. And I was frustrated. This was my recent, uh, you can call it one of the bad performances. And what I would just say is don't be so hard on yourself. It's easier said than done. I'm telling you all this. Who knows, tomorrow if it happens, I may still be hard on myself. But the best way is you will get over it. Because the moment, not many of you all know this, after that performance was the performance here. And when I came here, I still remember I was, there was a sofa here and I was doing that one role. Uh, one, one dialogue I said that um, in Haryanvi, that character says that self-respect naam ki kuch is hoti hai ki nahi hoti hai? And everyone started laughing. And that was it. I was like, this performance is my revenge for that. And everything went on the way. Now let me tell an interesting thing also. When the second performance happened, it was, I think, this class only, 6 to 8. Challenge was how will they connect? Because Two Adorable Losers, I thought, is for 8th and above. The first 15 minutes, I didn't have the audience with me. Mm -hmm. Then I said, OK, don't act. Just be a teacher. Because that was the character. And then it immediately clicked. And I was, that was, I think, most one of the gratifying moments when you get a lot of youngsters to connect with you. So many worst have turned into best and best has also turned into worst because of, of course, uh, course. unseen circumstances, unforeseen circumstances. No, that, so, yeah. That's great. That's what, what I'd like all of you to take away from whatever Abhishek is also saying is that if you do have a worst performance, it often culminates in a best performance eventually. So we don't leave it at a worst performance when you come on stage or when you get an opportunity to speak. If it doesn't work out, don't leave it there. Move on to the next sure. turn and I'm sure it'll get better. Anything on a parting note, we've had a great interaction, Abhishek, that you'd like to share uh, with respect to this TEDx platform to motivate and encourage our young audience today? Yes. Uh, first things first, that I'm really blessed that where I performed, I'm holding a TEDx talk. Um, this was, I think, uh, very few people get to do this. Very thankful to Sir, because um, he just offered that, do you want to come and be a part of it? I, I was not even thinking, but I knew TEDx talk. Yes, I want to do it. Um, I am doing a profession, you can call it. Uh, some people call it a calling, but for me, this is my career. And I said that, yes, I want to change perceptions. Uh, in your video, you had told me changing perceptions of theater. I remember that. And when people from outside start telling these things, it's a big responsibility. And I have taken this responsibility in a way where I know a lot of young people want to pursue theater, uh, especially outside Mumbai. And they just don't know how to go about it. I didn't know myself. I won't lie. I had my advantage. I am from Mumbai. But by the end of it, it doesn't matter. Theater is not restricted to one place. Uh, you can start off. Accidentally, I became a producer. But that is what has helped me. Please take every opportunity to come on stage. Please do all the mess ups. Because that's where you'll get your story. Two Adorable Losers has culminated from there. Any concept I have done. I was, um, uh, I, I hope you don't stream this, but I was in a boarding school. And now I'm writing a story about them. Please don't reveal that to them. But I was, I was, I was, I was, I'm totally making that story over there. So from anywhere, a story can come up. You may feel bad at that time, but years later, through my experience, what I've learned, you will always cherish it. And maybe you all will be the next uh, best writers and the theater entrepreneurs. Who knows how it goes? For sure, for sure. Yes. Thank you so much, Abhishek. From Jew to Nariman Point, from Prithvi <laughs> to uh, Tata Memorial, I hope. And of course, Muscat, Raipur, and a bunch of other cities in between. I hope in a few years we see you at Broadway too. Thank you so, so thank much. So thank you so much, Abhishek. Give him a big round of applause. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Anand, sir, and Patnayak, sir. Now, we have someone who has already created a good portfolio for himself. Sayyad Azman Ali Madni, a high school student at Bhatia Vidya Bhavans, Raipur. He is a science student who has inclinations in robotics, painting, and video editing. He loves to play lawn tennis too, and he believes in multitasking. Azman has already sailed through various researches 
and projects. Few of his researches and projects are liquid level alarm from January 2018 to December 2018. He was also active in emission generator. It showed that electricity generates through fuel emission. Next is detection technique for AKI, a novel home health monitoring platform for AKI and related diseases at a preliminary stage. Azman is an ace. At present, he is working on a screening solution for analyzing pathology data for lethal diseases. It is named as PASX. Currently, he is working as Chief Technology Officer at PASX. He is also the Joint Secretary at Interact Club of Ripo Genius, sponsored by Rotary Club of Ripo Greater from January 2022. Azman is also working as Chief Technology Officer at Grow Cool since December 2021. He started a non-profit organization for imbibing Gen Z skills. He was also selected in NCC annual training camp, which added one more feather to his cap. He grappled among top 10 teams at All India level in Youth Ideathon 2022. IIT Delhi for the project Pass X. Ranked between top 11 to 500 at All India level essay competition of ISRO Cyberspace 2020. He bagged A grade certificate in NCC also a surgeon rank holder 2020, qualified in the World Robotics Olympiad at the regional stage 2019, All India Global Jigyasa Quiz Contest 2.0, quarter finalist 2019, bagged third position scientific 2018, Triple IT Nairaipur for the project emission generator. He was a participant, AI for All, May 2020, a Guinness World Record for most people attending a symposium conducted by Intel India. He won merit certificate in MUN Level 2 program 2018-19. Sayyid Azman Ali Madni made his place in sports too. A gold medalist in 22nd state level school games of Federation of India 2022-23 in lawn tennis. Gold medalist in football. Inter House School Competition 2018. We wish you a colorful future ahead. So, audience, we have Sayyid Azman Ali to speak on Adapt to Change or Change to Adapt. Jahind, everyone. Jai Hind everyone. Jai. Good. I was sitting in a basketball court during a period reserved for my school activities. A sudden loud noise came from the ground resembling the soldiers. I discovered that NCC was conducting their training. I became intrigued at that point of time. NCC stands for National Cadet Corps, Unity and Discipline, where a cadet went through of two years primarily in his eighth and ninth grades. It also provides training thorough in like drills, weaponry, leadership related skills, and much more related to a soldier. I spent four years in a row holding sergeant rank in the NCC. Now, you might be wondering that why I said that NCC is for two years, but I actually spent four years there. You wonder? Yes. I. My career as an NCC cadet started from 2018 all the way to 2019. However, because of the pandemic, I'm really grateful that my school gave me the opportunity to train the following two batches of NCC. As we all are aware, 2020 and 2021 were the two difficult years for us. We were all stranded in our homes, hopeless to do nothing. One day, my ANO ma'am calls me and she asks if I would be able to take an online NCC class. Online NCC class. I was stunned when I heard this. Anyone who is familiar with NCC, I mean, how could we imagine where NCC refers to a profession where face-to-face -face interaction is valued so high, even though we could not do anything, there was no other option. That was the moment where I reflected on adaptation and change. 
before coming on to it, I want to ask that would you like to live in a forest, hunt and gather food, or use your hand motions and grunts to talk to your families and friends? No one, of course. Why would you? Millions of years ago, that's how our ancestors lived. Over the years, humans have been adapting to the change and changing how they acted and look until they became the most sophisticated species on the earth. Over the years, we have, humans have hundreds of special characters and features which allow them to survive, called adaptation. This adaptation allow early humans to use things from their hands like picking and holding plants, carrying their babies, making tools, and much more. By the time we walk, use things, and stand properly. However, we still cannot control weather. I know I'm off topic, but we cannot control weather. I mean, this is 21st century people. Why do I still have to worry that whether or not the roads will be closed due to snow or water? The urge to modify the world around us dates back to thousands of years. Thousands of years back. Since humans began into small communities and started, their, uh, started investing their time and effort into making environment easier to live in. For example, we began to adapt to water. This turn led their body on change. Therefore, we have been altering into environment or adapting to improve our quality of life. Coming towards the process of adaptation, a little facts, there have been two definitions. One is the process of biological adaptation and other is the process of non-biological adaptation. Both refers to the human, how they've altered to the environment to aid in survival. Change. A quick website says, the change is making someone or something different, alter or modify. In addition to this, I surely believe that change is an ability and adapt to change is something what makes our life goes on. We experience change on a very frequent basis, even multiple times a day. Change can be something which is related to oneself. Change, however, we can say change is a constant staple of our life. Change in one life can improve her, uh, make him better, move forward, and even a small variation in one's life can bring joy and life satisfaction. Change sometimes are positive, sometimes are negative, or even little or no significance. Some changes are little and inconsequential, while some are of some kind of dramatically affect our lives. Can I define change as acceptance and adaptation? Can I? Why not? Yes. Our body and physiology have been carefully tailored by nature and evolution for hundreds of thousands of years. During the evolutionary journey of we humans, we have been designed and redesigned to withstand with the physical and emotional challenges in life. Coming to the concept of change, as I said before also, change is becoming different. But by the name itself, change is neither positive nor negative. It depends on how we perceive it. I just want you all to just recap what I have told you in the beginning about the story, the change in situation which made me to adapt. Online NCC class, yes. Adapt to change or change to adapt irrespective of the word which comes first, is a skill which allows us to face new situations and uh, challenges as they arise. For example, you're shifting into roles at your company or you're starting a new job where you have to develop and redevelop your skills and even take on unfamiliar responsibilities. Hence, adapt to change needs the flexibility and ready, readiness to the new situations. Before ending, Before ending, I want you all to just listen carefully to the two statements, okay? And analyze yourself where you stand. A person A who think change in a bad way and feel uptight and hate making adjustment to his daily routines. Or a person B who tend to see change as an opportunity, energizing and open to new informations. If 
you agree yourself as a person A, then you are uncomfortable with change. And if you agree yourself as a person B, then you have an ability to change and changes demand. I want to share some of few moments in my life where I connected between adapt to change or change to adapt. SGFI. SGFI stands for School Games Federation of India. I'm talking about September 2022. I wanted to play in SGFI on the sport lawn tennis. The first thought which came into my mind, do I really want it to play? Do I really want it to participate? I said yes to myself. How? Let me tell you, honestly, I didn't even touch my racket for even two years. But the fact or the belief that I wanted to play made me to realize that I wanted to become that person B. Change. Intra club. Intra club are sponsored by Rotary Club. I'm currently as a joint secretary in Intra club of Raipur Genius, sponsored by Rotary Club of Raipur Greater. It's a club which is totally managed by the students of different schools under 19 where we held different social events, fellowship events, and much more. This, again, was also a change in the situation for me. Attitude of change, happiness of charity. Youth Adathon. Youth Adathon is an innovation competition where we emphasize more on uh, startup ideas and entrepreneurship skills in students. Me and my team members, we were three of them. We went to IIT Delhi with our project Pars X. The, we have a slogan, one test for deadly disease. We ranked among top 10 in all over India and we were also awarded with one lakh rupees as an incubation grant to develop our project. I am really grateful and I want to thank my mentor, Sushil Kumar Pandey sir, for always pushing us, pushing us and making us always and being positive to go ahead and just be on that activity or the competitions you are facing right now. You know what? What I believe. Whether it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter whether you win or lose. But the thing which matters the most is what change you have made it to yourself. In conclusion, I just want to say that adaptation and change are the two constants of life. With each day, we learn both together and make the best of it. Best of it. Thank you. Now, may I request principal? Now, may I request principal, sir, to present a memento to Azman. Thank you, Principal Sir. Anand Sir, may we have you on the stage to have an interaction with Azman? Hey, Azman, how are you doing? Fine, sir. How, are you? how does it feel after this speech of yours? Relaxed. And let's move a little. Relaxed. Relaxed. Usman, you seem to be uh, a king of all trades, uh, by the looks of it. I see a lot of science in there, I see NCC in there, I see Interact Club in there, I saw a little bit of sports in there, now you see a TED talk in there. So, you definitely seem to be doing a lot of things for a grade 12 student. How do you manage all of this and how, uh, what, what is that piece of news that you'd give all of your friends here from grade 6 to 8 that would allow them to do the same thing? And there's of ca academics, of course, right? You, you're giving your boards too, right? Ah, yeah. <laughs> Jay also, very good. So how, how are you managing all of this? Please let everybody know. Okay. So the society says to me, you know, you are in 12th. You have your boards. You, are you preparing for J? I said, yeah, true. I will. 
बट द फैक्ट विच आई हैव इन माई माइंड ऑलवेज दैट समवन सेज दैट यू नो यू कान डू दिस यू नो यू आर नॉट एबल टू प्ले टेनिस यू आर नॉट एबल टू प्ले फुटबॉल और यू आर नॉट गुड विथ वॉलीबॉल एंड समथिंग एल्स द फैक्ट विच आई हैव इन माई माइंड ऑलवेज दैट वॉट द हेल इज द थिंग विच आई कैन नॉट नो विच आई कैन नॉट अंडरस्टैंड आई वॉन्ट टू लर्न सो द फैक्ट ऑफ गेटिंग एंड रीचिंग टू ईच एंड एवरी फील्ड हेल्प मी अर लॉट Got it. So you want to expose yourself to as many fields as possible. Yes, sir. All right. So when you talk about adaptability, obviously when you go into all of these different fields, there's a lot of adaptation. You know, you at uh, this wonderful forum with uh, your friends is very different from you being on this forum speaking today. So how do you train your mind to adapt to these situations as a twelfth grader? As a twelfth grader, I I don't feel. that as a 12th grader i means it doesn't matter even right. you are in 9th class 10th right. 11th 12th it doesn't matter but the place where you stand that matters what your what respect you give it to that place mm -hmm. and after being so much in continuously in other fields like scientific era wro world robotics if i talk about interact club i feel that coming to here is nothing endless mm -hmm. it's, it's just beyond our mind Great I think that was very profound extremely profound as an answer any words on a parting note that you'd like to share with your friends that would motivate and encourage them to be a part of this platform as a speaker I just want you all to just have a word in your mind just be in reality we always think that if I would take an example that I want to go IIT Delhi I'll think in my mind yes I want to go IIT Delhi I am in IIT Delhi. I am there. I am picking this branch. I am going with this profession and all stuffs. Never ever keep in your mind that you are in IIT Delhi. Just keep in mind that you are going to be in IIT Delhi. That state of mind. It's very important. Be in reality. I I am not saying like don't see the dreams. It's very important to see the dreams. But making the dream happen in reality, that makes yourself where you stand. Thank you so much. So what Usman is saying for all of us, yes, he deserves a round of applause for sure. He say, be adaptable, be resi don't be resistant to change, be aspirational, but always see the bigger picture with your feet on the ground, yes. isn't it? Yes, so thank you so much, Usman. Give him a round of applause. You totally deserve thank it. You so much. Thank, you. thank you, Anand sir and Usman. As my friend stated at the beginning, that the world is full of gems. we have another gem with us steve matthew a first year junior college student of biomaths at bharatiya vidya bhavan's vidya mandir thrissur kerala he is a voracious reader and loves games and sports too he also added feathers in his cap by winning prizes in quiz writing competitions to shed light a candle must be lit to evoke a transformation you must transform transformation from within is a talk focusing on this concept transformation within means a transformation in your mental health an idea almost completely neglected by us so here we have steve to enlighten us no i'll do that have you ever felt stressed anxious or maybe even lost i have and you must have too about half the adults and teens in india were suffering from increased levels of stress and anxiety let's go back in time back to the late 1940s many of our grandparents were still children they had to traverse through things that are even hard to imagine now they tell stories about their hard lives and the hardships they had to face every day let's move on let's skip a few years and go to 1970s and 80s they had their fair share of troubles they had to deal with a lot of things that we didn't have to they didn't have the privileges that we had remember your mom and dad telling how they had to go to school by crossing the ganga and climbing mount everest all these people faced a lot of problems in their lives but very few had issues with their mental health how many of you know what mental health means 
Good, you may put your hands down. I'll define it for you. Mental health is a state of mental well-being that allows people to cope with the stresses of life, work well, learn well, and contribute to the community. It is an integral part of our well-being that underpins our individual and collective abilities to make decisions and transform the world. We've all been sick, haven't we? Yeah, the same thing can happen with mental health. Mental health conditions include mental disorders and mental states associated with stress and anxiety. Let me ask you a question. What images come to your mind when you hear mental illness? Maybe this, or even this. But let me tell you, a fairly normal looking person might be suffering from mental illness. Many mental illnesses are not prominent outsides. About 57 lakh cases of depression has been reported in India, and a bigger number goes unreported. The new generation has seen a drastic increase in mental health issues. Why do you think this is so? Factors affecting mental health. Now, today we'll be discussing a few major facts that are the causes of this mental health issues. First being constantly connected. Technology is great. It connects us with people far away and give insight to their lives just by scrolling through our phones. But sometimes we see the so-called perfect individuals and feel inadequate. Sometimes we see people in devastating conditions and worry on their behalf. In a world where we ourselves have a lot of worries, this affects us drastically. Doing too much. It's no surprise that we live in a competitive community. Getting a job or getting into college is way harder than it used to be. As the population is increasing, opportunities for jobs and opportunities to get into college is getting slimmer and slimmer. This makes us work twice as hard. Moreover, having mandatory classes of dance, music, and sports after a long, exhausting day of school or work is just too much. Don't force anything on yourself. You may lose your passion. Relationships. Parents undergo a lot of parenting stress. Managing difficult jobs, doing the household chores, and raising children is sometimes very stressful. Some parents let this stress on their kids. Some parents will be tyrannical, unreasonable, and negative to their children. This, in turn, affects the children. In a, in a relationship, one member can pass his or stress or anxiety to the other members. So always be aware of the relationships you get yourself into. Environmental changes. Pollution plays a major role in affecting our mental health. Air pollution degrades our physical health. Noise pollution devoids us of our peaceful mind and our time to think. All the towns and cities nowadays are filled with bright billboards and flashy posters and flyers. This acts as stimulants and makes our mind distracted. This, in turn, makes us feel stressed out. This is something we expected to be here, didn't we? I think the children agree. About 64% of all Indian students reported stress due to academics. This tells us something. There is a major flaw in our education system. Schools focus too much on grades and not acknowledge overall growth. Teachers who consciously or subconsciously hurt the students' feelings add to this prevailing condition. Back home, parents may do the same. By pressuring kids to their utmost limit and not being reasonable to them or listening to them, this makes the students feel stressed out. Now, let's go back to the question that I asked you earlier. What causes the increase in mental health issues in the new generation? Has your answer changed or does it remain the same? Now that we know the problems, let's find something else. What? Remedies. First, unplug from your smartphone. 
Sitting on your phone all day and scrolling through it and worrying for others won't make a change. Use that time for something productive. Maybe a stress relieving activity. But there are harmful stress relieving activities. Some which gives pleasure or relief for a few moments but leaves the person in shambles. Some such kind of harmful stress relieving activities are drugs and alcohols which is very much prominent in our community today. And some other which we usually skip over are overeating, spending too much screen time and withdrawing from social activities. This all has ill effects on your mental health. Change in attitude and approach. This applies to teachers, parents, students and children. Teachers and parents should be reasonable and understanding towards students and children. They are from a different era than you are. The methods that work for you might not work for them. You should be reasonable to your children. Parents, comparing your children to others, mocking them or verbally stating that you give up on them are some of the worst things a child can hear. Don't do that. Each and every child is capable and potential of doing everything. A better education system. I told you before, our education system needs improvement. There's a lot of space for improvement. I'm not saying it's bad, it's good, but there need to be a lot of better education systems. The time we're living now is filled with troubles, worries, and our anxiety levels are through the roof. But we need to understand something. The new generation is different. Each and every one of them is a genius. They have an ingenious idea within them. It's our job to work together and bring these ideas out. When we work together with these kids, a transformational idea comes out. Don't focus on their weaknesses. Focus on their strength. The world so desperately needs a transformation. And may that transformation begin with you. Thank you. Thank you. Now may I request Principal Sir to hand over the memento to Steve. Thank you, sir. Congratulations. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you. Do well, huh? Yes. Thank you, Principal Sir and Steve. Now may I request Anand Sir to please have an interaction with Steve. Hey Steve, how are you doing man? I'm fine. Alright, all the way from Trisur, I was just having a discussion with uh, Principal Sir, Mr. Amitabh Ghosh, about the level of effort that your parents and your school have put into you coming all the way to Raipur to be a part of this forum. So big round of applause. Thank you. Is, is your father or mother in the Yes, audience? my dad's there. Oh, please give him a huge round of applause as well, please. Uh, it's, it's not the easiest thing to be coming all the way down from up from Trisur to Raipur. And you've delivered a wonderful talk. I think it's inspiring. One of the things that I was noticing and uh, I happened to notice before everything started off is a little bit of audience engagement you did while the mic testing process was on. So you definitely seem to be a natural at this and I hope that you keep this going. Thank you. Let's come to your talk. Um, talking about mental health, uh -huh. right? Um, it's a very sensitive issue. Yes. It is an issue that deserves a lot more uh, importance and awareness than it receives yes. as of today. My question is, um, you know, a lot of us keep talking about mental health and obviously when we are in school, mm -hmm. we probably don't understand the complexities associated with it. What is it that got you to really come down to this kind of a talk and spread this idea? Mm -hmm. Because mental health is not something that uh, we'd expect the everyday student in a school to be talking about. So what is it that got you interested in this conversation? Well, there's a lot of stigma around mental health. 
many of the parents and teachers think that mental health is something that they shouldn't be worried about. Kids face a lot of mental health issues and parents don't understand that. Kids are very good at hiding things. And here, yes, kids are very good at hiding things. How many of you keep secrets? Oh, there's a lot of kids, <laughs> uh, naughty kids. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. they hide all the issues they have and this add up and add up and lead to very bad problems. That can, can sometimes be very terrible. And I thought I should speak this out in front of such a large audience. This should be acknowledged everywhere. And I think schools should do a lot more to pr uh, prevent mental health disorders. I'd like to ask you a sensitive question. And I'm sorry if these questions are rather sensitive, but you've chosen a topic of yes. that sort. No, that's fine. Um, in and around you, in your school or in your vicinity, how many children of your age or young adults of your age do you see who suffer from mental health issues that aren't addressed or aren't even accepted for that matter? Way more than we think. Mm -hmm. Very lo a lot of my friends have mental issues, but they don't understand it, nor do their parents. When we see them sitting at the corner and having a talk to themselves, we understand something's wrong, but other people say that they're plain. No, it should be addressed. Some kids don't understand they have mental issues and they carry on with their lives trying to be something other than themselves. Mm -hmm. And this should be addressed. A lot of kids, I mean a lot of kids in my school, the people who I interact with, even adults I've seen have been dealing with mental health issues. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure. And it's something that all of us need to pay attention mm -hmm. to. We need to find ways to deal with yes. different issues that we face. Yes. And I'm glad, Steve, that you have shed light on this from a young adult's perspective. Yes. Uh, talking about uh, mental health, another thing that comes to mind is we had this pandemic, mm -hmm. which was very unfortunate in the history of the world, two years. Uh, I don't know where they went, actually. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, post the pandemic, you know, there have been a lot of changes. A lot of people have faced these kinds of issues. Yes. What are the things that uh, you think uh, people have done to tackle these in schools or things that you've seen that are positive? Mm -hmm. Isolation due to the pandemic yes, caused yes. a lot of problems. Yes, absolutely. So I see when they came to school, they start to interact with people more. I haven't seen this. Boys and girls all interact a lot more with each other. I think they were desperate for social activities. So I can see currently this year, I can see a lot of improvement in kids. Those who came in shy, who were sad all the time, and who had a bad look on their face are now turning out to be more cheerful. And I think the social activity is one of the greatest things that can help to overcome this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, any parting words for this young audience of grades six to eight in Raipur that you would like to share? If you have some problems, don't worry, speak out. Speak to your parents or your teachers or somebody you trust. Always have a good mindset. Things may go bad, but at the last, everything will turn out fine. All right, what a fine young man you are, Steve. <laughs> Wish him all the very best. In fact, I would like to take the liberty. Sir, if you could please join us on stage as well. Please, sir. Please, sir. I'd like to take this effort as well. Uh, I've taken uh, liberty to do this, sir. But uh, um, I think both father and son deserve a good round of applause. Uh, fact is, um, Giving a speech of this sort is an arduous task coming from another geography um, as a student to prepare for this speech is an even more arduous task which is not possible without the support of the school, without the support of the parents and of course without the support of a school like Bhavan's Raipur which has opened out uh, applications for TEDx speakers to schools all across the entire Bhavan's fraternity. So I'm very glad sir that you had the vision to do this which has allowed for ideas to germinate and come from all across the country. And it has resulted in an individual like Steve joining us today as well. So uh, a big round of applause for sir and your school. It's not something that every school is, you know, um, uh, very generous to do because at the end of the day, we always think of giving opportunities within. Sir has decided to define the word within as a much larger thing. So well done, sir, and well done to the school. Sir, if you'd like to share a few words, we'd be very grateful, sir, about this experience and otherwise. It was really a wonderful and great experience for me, and I consider it is really a privilege to uh, come and join this great event. I'm grateful to you all, especially Principal Sir. Um, thank you.
Thank you so much, sir. Thank you so much, Steve. We shall be seeing you very soon, I suppose. <laughs> All right. Hopefully. Take care. Yes, bye-bye. Thank you, Anand, sir, and Steve. With this, we come to the end of the first lot of TED Talk. I extend my gratitude to all the speakers to spare their time with us and help us to explore. Keep smiling, keep learning. Now, I request Anand, sir, to wrap up the first lot. Hey everyone, I think you've seen a lot of me already, so I'm not quite sure whether you want to see too much more of me. Um, so I'm not going to take much of your time. Uh, I'm not going to go into uh, talking about the concept of TED because, uh, you know, um, the concept of TED is a reality that has shown itself to you all today by virtue of speakers um, starting off with, of course, a wonderful speech delivered by one of our students, then we had uh, an adult speaker and then we had two more students delivering such wonderful speeches on different different ideas what I want all of you to understand is that the objective of TED is not for y'all to listen to a speech and go back home the reason your school actually hosts events like this is TED is all about ideas worth spreading okay what you have received today is not four speeches you have received four ideas okay and each of these ideas is sure to have had a big impact on you in some way or the other. As students of grade six to eight, it might be difficult for you all to realize what the impact of this idea is today, but I want you to go back home and think about it, all right? And since TEDx is about ideas, I want to know from any of you all seated here, we are approximately what, uh, probably a large number of students for sure. I would like to ask all of you, do any of you have an idea or something that you'd like to speak about on stage today? Trust me, you won't get this opportunity again. Do any of you have an idea that you'd like to speak about on stage? I'm not calling you on stage. Now tell me, do you have any idea that you'd like to share with us? Is there an idea that you'd probably like to come up with in a few years from now that you think you'd be able to share on the platform? The answer is not left and right. The answer is within. I'll give you 30 seconds, think about it. Any idea? Your school has so many wonderful students participating in ICEF, uh, science fair, science exhibitions. You have a great system of NCC, sports events, public speaking events, different platforms, great things in academics as well. It is giving you so many different avenues. I'm sure some of you are already using some of these. Do you think there is an idea that you believe might be worth spreading. Yes, I see one hand going up. Anybody else? Yes, I see a few hands going up. Can you put up the lights, please? Can you switch the lights on at the back? I want to speak with the audience. Yes, yes, yes. You have an idea? You have a few ideas? Okay, great. Yes, we see a lot more hands going up. That's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. And after eleven now, you know, this works exponentially typically. So we have what, twenty-two now? We probably have 30 now. Great. Do any of you have an idea that you'd like to speak about with us right now? Oh yes, we have one hand right up there. Come, come, come. Come. The student right there wants to come. Come, come, don't worry. Give him a round of applause. Come on. Okay, I'll, I'll help you build on that idea. Come, give him a mic. Yeah, come. Don't worry, it's not a prepared speech. Come, what's your name, Baba? Come, come. Come, what's your name? Rajwansh. Rajwansh, all right. Yes, Rajwansh, what is the idea that you believe that in a few years from now you might be able to present on this platform? Sir, uh, robots can be uh, the thing that can spread in future. All right. He believes that robots are going to grow in the future and perform many functions that we perform today. Is it? Yes, sir. 
are you interested in the field of robotics sir uh, half means not full but yes okay somewhat somewhat eventually yes. you believe that you will develop that level of interest in robotics yes sir and why do you believe that robots are going to take over uh, a lot of things that we do because sir it uh, helps us to uh, it makes our work easier it makes our work easier all right do you already see a few robots around you yes give me yes. an example sir uh, like you have seen that uh, that uh, that roomba that cleans uh, yes sir yes sir vacuum cleaner oh yes sir vacuum yeah they are robots right yes sir okay there are many robots that are already taking the world over around us all right but very good give him a round of applause give rajwansh a round of applause what i want you to think about rajwansh is you go and speak to your teachers go and speak to sushil sir tell him that you want to develop a robot that will take over the world okay i'm sure he'll help you and in a few years from now you'll also be a part of icef all right like uh, usman azman was all right thank you so much rajwansh give him a round of applause all right anybody else yes come 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 we are going to have we have a little bit of time thank you come 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 good morning sir good morning what's up what's your name so my name is vidansh agrawal vidansh yes vidansh what is that idea that you believe is worth spreading so sir my idea is about science mm -hmm. so i want to invent something a sort of machine which which will automatically attract the plastic materials from the garbage But because plastic is the major thing due to which many diseases are, are being spread like i was even a patient of jaundice in 2019 and i was uh, having so major jaundice that i was even and that i was even admitted to hospital uh, i was there for two weeks and after i discharged i felt like there should be something on working age and from that time i was thinking a lot that what should be done to come over this idea after i after a few years of research i came to know that because of this plastic the most of the diseases are being spread so i am still thinking about some ideas so that i can make machines or artificial magnets which will automatically attract plastics to them and there will be less diseases spread across children and even adults very good vedansh i think that's a very noble idea that's I think that's a very noble idea it's a very noble thought and I hope that you're able to achieve uh, this idea that I'd like to informally call a plastic magnet yeah we call this a plastic magnet for now and I'm sure you'd be able to work on it and I want all of you to think about this as well how are you going to achieve this objective it's not just vedansh but it's an idea that he has spread among you all today okay and that's what this platform is about thank you so much vedansh we have time for a few more the idea is to yes come 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 I'm trying. I'm trying to be inclusive, all sides. I'll give everybody a chance. Now I see so many more people wanting to come up, which is great. Good afternoon, sir. I am Jay Jadwani. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Jay. Yes. So basically, we all are experiencing a lot of financial, not financial, but there are a lot of changes in the life of every one of us. maybe financial or health issues or anything mm -hmm. the costing and all have really increased so many these days mm -hmm. so one of them may be through the cost of electricity mm -hmm. so i with one of my friend is planning for an electro multiplier mm -hmm. that will multiply the electricity up to seven times mm -hmm. that may save up the cost you are spending on electricity the the thing that you will invest much is the much you will get if in the morning you give it 500 volts it will give you 3500 in just a small rotation we are planning planning on that way it can be implemented in schools that use up much energy and even we have comparative studies with generators and all generators you can say as a multi generator they basically generate up to 1x electricity but we have a model that may be to the size of uh, even a small box but it will give you 7x energy that you invest on in it got it got it so you are trying to ramp up power to save electricity yes all right very good very good i hope that this idea becomes a reality thank you thank you so much jay thank you so much thank you so much all right we have time for a few more ideas 
All right, there is a popular support for you, so I'll call you first. Come, a lot of popular support. We had about 10 hands in all directions pointing at her, so I'm sure she has a great idea. Come, 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 come. Yeah, yeah, I have the mic. You come. Here. First, first her, then you just wait in line. I'm so happy, you know. Initially, you remember how nobody wanted to come on stage? What happened? Why are all of you wanting to come on stage now? It's probably because of that early bird who came up. Rajvansh. Yeah. Yes, it's because of Rajvansh. Next time you be that Rajvansh who comes first. All right? Yeah? Take the initiative. It's very important. Here you're getting an opportunity and I'm going to call a lot of you up. Life is probably not going to give you those opportunities. There'll be a one and done at times. So make sure you grasp that opportunity. Remember, that's what they tell you when you go for the IIT J's as well. This is what applies when it comes to soft skills too. All right? Yes. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. What's your name? Lavanya. Yes, Lavanya. What's your idea? Uh, see, uh, except for the science and mathematical ideas, uh, I'm going to share a moral idea, which mm -hmm. is uh, not so common in the youngsters and the teenagers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I sound like a mature person, mm -hmm. but uh, yes, many people haven't realized it. You need to be advanced as a child, like uh, in uh, grades 5th, 6th, 7th, etc. Uh, the children are like, oh my god, I want to look beautiful. I want to be like, uh, oh yeah, I'm trendy, oh yeah. So uh, that's not like that. You think, what, uh, what are the opportunities? Uh, people when go to 10th, they are like, oh my god, now I have to crack JE. No, think about JE from now. Why don't you? So, uh, you have to think about future uh, to, make your, uh, to make yourself proud first, and then your teachers, parents, and everyone around you. So, you have to realize it fast that uh, there are many, many opportunities around you, and you need to just grab them. So you know, should not miss, like I'm not uh, of that age or something like that. And don't focus on the nonsense like trend, style, etc. Focus on yourself, build up yourself so that uh, the thing which 10th graders do uh, where, when they come in 10th, 11th, etc. You have to do it now in 7th. So imagine how good you will be in the 10th. Thank you so much, Lavanya. Sir, you really have brilliant students. <laughs> In the seventh standard, I was thinking about which cartoon to watch. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> so it's brilliant. No, absolutely. I was just kudos to sir and all your teachers. Uh, you seem to be thinking well into uh, the future, which is the idea. You know, think well into the future is the idea. And uh, don't run after trends, build your own trend. Yeah. And it doesn't simply apply to JE, it applies to all the other opportunities that you see all over you. Okay? So start thinking about them today. Because otherwise, you know, your school could have easily gotten the grade 11 and 12 students to sit as a part of today's session also. Why are all of you here today? It's because we want to inspire you, we want to motivate you, we want you to realize that these are the platforms that will probably teach you skills that nothing else can, okay? And if you really want to build on an idea, an idea for a TEDx forum doesn't start off with a preparation for a speech two months before. If you see all of those different uh, speeches that were given, they were based on a lot of ideas that people were working on for many years, or at least for a sizable amount of time. So you start working on that idea, whether it transforms into a TED talk or not doesn't matter. What matters is that you've worked on that idea. All right? Thank you so much, Lavanya. Yes, we had that poor child. Where's that child? Come, 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 come. Where's, no, no, where's? The, yeah, yeah, come, come, come. Sorry, yeah, sorry. What's your name? So my name is Vipu Shohan. Veer Piyush Shohar. Hi Piyush. Yes. What's the idea? So this is my idea and my dream too that from I was a child I love gardening and space. As my idea is to grow in now we are new in the future. The space, all the organization in space are thinking about to settle colonies in around the universe on different planets like Mars. So my idea is to grow plants in Mars and different planets. Okay. So you want to actually grow? Yes, sir. Different thing. Okay, that's very interesting. That's very interesting, Piyush. All right. Thank you so much. Give him a round of applause. We are going to be running out of time very quickly. 
So I'll entertain two more ideas and uh, just to keep uh, the gender parity, it's going to be two girls. So that'll be one and uh, okay, come. And two, two, yeah, two. No, no, actually wait, anybody at the back, any girl right at the very back, only girls. Yes, come, you will come. And you also come, fine, yes. Come quickly, come quickly. We're running short on time. Yeah. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon. What's your name? My name is Asnaya Sridhar. I'm from class 6B. All right. And today I'm going to share an idea that mm -hmm. I think which will help children in the future. Mm -hmm. See, I have read a book mm -hmm. called Rich Dad Poor Dad, mm -hmm. which tells a formula mm -hmm. of money. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, I have learned some things and I would like to share it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, some people, like when we are kids, I think we should start to invest for the future. Mm -hmm. So that in future we will be fi we'll get financial freedom mm -hmm. because that's very important. Fi we have to be financially free, free. That's very important for our lives. Mm -hmm. That's why I wanted to share this. Mm -hmm. I, I also started investing. My you already started investing. Yes, wow. my dad has. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I gave all the money to my dad. He is investing. And I think I should tell you some points about investing. Mm -hmm. First, you should always research before you invest. Second, you should always invest in a growing company. Mm -hmm. And first, you have to research because then your money is gone. <laughs> gone. <laughs> gone. Okay, so basically you should not invest blindly, you should invest in growing companies. Yes. And you should think before you do this. Yes. All right, thank you so much. That is brilliant advice. That's Thanks. brilliant advice. That's probably better advice than most financial advisors would give you today. That's neat. All right, yes. Come, come, come. Yes, what's your name, Baba? Good afternoon, sir. It's Good afternoon. Eva. It's really nice to meet you. Yes, hi, Eva. What's hi. your idea? Um, basically, I want to talk about beauty, uh, insecurities, and priori prioritizing yourself. We all are really focused towards looking beautiful. Well, let me tell you that beauty is not on the outside, it's what's on the inside that matters. And yeah, a lot of us face through insecurities, um, but we don't talk about it. A lot of us, even me, I don't talk about it. But as I have got this opportunity, I would like to talk about this that it's okay to have insecurities. It's okay if you don't talk about it, but what's important that you don't have to cope up with it. You can overcome it. You can talk to someone about it. It's not something that you just have to go through. You can get out of it. Yeah, and there comes like what the other person will think and not prioritizing yourself, giving more attention to what the other person is thinking. No, it's important to prioritize yourself. It's important to put your focus towards you to basically grow yourself and inspire others. You know, you can't pour tea if your own teacup is empty. So grow yourself first and then inspire others to grow. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you so much. That was a very, very, very power pack speech. You're speaking from the heart. Well done. Thank you so much. Very, very profound, deep impact. Yes. Uh, so one more and uh, one more child and then I was, I'll call you, sir. Of course, we have to call you. Yes, quickly come, come, come. We are running short on time. Come, 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 come. Hello, everybody. My name is Anshika Su. So basically, let's come out from the water wastage, the electricity wastage. Let's come to the main people of our country who are the farmers. The one fact of them, they carry one to two liter tanks in their shoulders and sprinkle fertilizer to their crops. I want to make something to reduce that because that's the reason for which the farmers are getting some health issues, back issues, etc. So I want to make a machine in which it would include two compartments. The first compartment would include seeds which will sprinkle the seeds at the soil and when it grows up the second compartment would uh, 
spray the fertilizers to the soil. Thank you so much. That's very interesting. You must work on it. It's something that's important. You know, you call it agri-tech in today's times. And I think agri-tech is very important when we talk about development of India. Thank you so much. Okay, give all yourselves, all yourselves a huge round of applause. I think you have done fabulously well. And I think that all of you have worked very hard. I see a lot of hands going up. We are short on time. And I think at this point in time, we need the chief ideation officer of your school coming up. Sir, wanted to share a few points as well. Uh, Principal Sir, Mr. Amitav Ghosh, please give him a huge round of applause. Uh, this has been possible only thanks to his vision. All right? I think his idea, sir is going to share a lot more, is y'all, all right? And I'm so glad to see the kind of work that we see with all of you. So please. Okay. Uh, thank you, Anand. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, I'll just speak, you know, about certain things that these thoughts are instantaneous. I haven't prepared any speech and uh, really haven't worked on any speech like all of you have so dedicatedly worked, my speakers. But my idea, when I was listening to all of you, I was thinking that all of you epitomize unstoppable us. Have you heard of something called unstoppable us? Anybody? Anyone? Unstoppable us. Have you heard this anywhere? Where? Who is saying yes? Okay, I think you're not very sure. Have you heard of someone called Yuval Noah Harari? Okay, other than the stalwarts. <laughs> My students. Anybody? Yeah, tell me. Just stand up and say that. What is he? What do you know about him? Brilliant. So, so a big round of applause for him, please. <laughs> Chaitanya, right? Chaitanya, okay, great. So, you well know Harari has written multiple books. And I think at your age, they may not sound very appropriate when you read them because many of the things that he says may not occur to you at this point of time. But his latest book is called Unstoppable Us. Read it. Because that book is going to make a lot of sense to children of classes 6 to 8. And after Unstoppable Us, there's another quote of the book. It says, how humans took over the world. So, he makes a very simple argument. As human beings, we can't run as fast as the monkeys. Can, you, can anybody run faster than a monkey? No. We can't swim as well as the fish. No? Okay. So when we can't run, we can't swim, we can't climb, how did we as human beings take over the world? So, Yuval Nua Harari speaks of three things. One is we have three abilities that helped us to prevail in this world and we eradicated a lot of other people from this world. We actually eradicated everybody else. Every bigger creature of the world was, went extinct because the humans took over the world. Now this was because of three things. One is human beings had the ability to cooperate with one another. So, individually you may be useless, individually you may be weak, but you always had the ability to gang up and beat somebody up. It happens. So, individually you may be weaker than an elephant, but if 10 of you will gang up, an elephant will run away. Correct? So, first idea that he gives is cooperation. Human beings have an immense ability to cooperate with each other knowingly or unknowingly. Just take a look when you walked out of your house today morning, how many people cooperated with you to reach this place? Knowingly or unknowingly? When you, were, when you got down from your house, 
somebody didn't come and crash you. Somebody didn't come and crash with you on a scooter. So unadvertently, the gentleman cooperated. Your bus driver helped you to come to school. From the school, your teachers helped you to board the buses. So a host of people cooperated with you to bring you here. And half of them did it without knowing that they are cooperating. So cooperation is an inherent, inbuilt feature of human beings which help them survive. Second is the fact that we look very deceptive. So an elephant may appear humongous to you, may appear a monster. An orangutan or a chimpanzee may appear to be a monster. If that thing comes in front of you, everybody will run away. Yes, but the chimpanzee will never think that if, you know, as individual human being, it will never get, you know, it will, it will never feel threatened by us. So what happens? A human a chimpanzee will ignore us. But the moment 10 of us come together, the chimpanzee will run away. So as humans, we also appear very deceptive. We don't appear threatening. So we can fool people. I am not very clever. You are cleverer than me. But in reality, I am cleverer. And the third and the most important fact that helped humans take over the world is humans knew how to light a fire. They could strike two stones and light a fire anywhere. So what happened? Every animal, however big the size of the animal, was afraid of fire. So just by lighting a fire, they could wipe out forests. So half the bigger animals were destroyed in the forest because they could not run. So that is how human beings took over the world. And all of you should read this book, this latest book. It will make a lot of sense to you. And as a school, now why I talk of this book? As a school, when we hear a lot many ideas like this, we should also learn, we also learn to cooperate using these ideas. Because each of these ideas will help to make the world a better place. Yes? And that is why we need ideas and we need forums like this where you could spread your ideas. So all of you should now gear up and all of you should now visualize that one day you will stand here and give a TED talk which, will be sh which, which can be seen by any person in the world on his mobile. Yes? Thank you so much. Thank you for being so patient. God bless all of you. Thank you so much, sir. And thank you so much, students. We leave you with a carnival of ideas, actually, today. You had four in the speeches. Actually, you had many more in the speeches, but at least four you can count. And uh, there were about eight, and then one very profound, elaborate idea that sir has also shared with you all, the whole concept of unstoppable us. So what I want all of you to do is, when you go home today, just spend 15 minutes thinking about whatever uh, these different ideas were. Don't pen down anything if you don't want to. Then think of one idea that you'd like to add to it that's your own, okay? Something that you strongly feel about, okay? That's all I want you to do. If you do this, the objective of this particular forum has been achieved, all right? So I hope that all of you continue to spread ideas that are worth spreading continue to think of ideas that are worth spreading, and continue to be the idea that's worth spreading. All right? So that's what TED is about. Thank you so much. I look forward to seeing all of you very soon. Yes.
Hello, mic test. One, two, three, one, two, three. Hello, 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 hello. Okay, how do I work? What is the... Is this okay? <coughs> hello, hello. Mic testing. Sound check. I think it's fine. Hello, hello. Much better, no? Is this a, um, I spent the past decade. Okay, so I'm. I'm wait, I need to uh, put this somewhere. The struggle. Sorry, I'm wasting your time. Working on it. Okay, for now. The mic is closer. Okay. We're rolling. Oh, eight minute ball right. Can we move the um, screen closer? Can we? Yeah, because if I can't go next to the speaker, I can't see. We can go full screen on it, maybe. Or you could keep it there near the speaker. <coughs> Is there a reason the colors are off on this? You're kidding me. I mean, it doesn't matter, but. It's quite bad. Nice. You don't like my blue? Oh, you like the black? Yeah, but that's black. Okay, I'm blind. I know, I know, but I wanted to see. This is just live. This is what it's called. I don't know, one minute, relax. Huh? How dare you? Huh? He's calling me, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. But this is, a, why am I not? What is going to happen? Okay, wait, hold on. Oh, you're changing here. You want to follow me? You're basically mimicking me. Got it. Okay. I'm doing a whole dry run. But my boy? <coughs> okay. There's something off with the way it's showing as well. Look at that. Hello. I'm not okay with that now. If you're recording this. Wait, why is it a PowerPoint? That's why. <coughs> no, it's a PDF. Something has gone off between the two of these in the recent night. Correctly, of course, fix it ASAP because someone made it fake out. We can't go full screen. No, but I can make all of these <laughs> JPEGs and export them for you. No, but this would as a Aray, but this is fine now, no? Go back. Go back to the first one. Yeah, but he's saying there's a problem. What is the problem? No, there's no problem as such. But it's, it's going to be a PDF. But we can't go full screen on the PDF? Yeah, we can. Yeah. 
So what is the issue? This is fine. This is fine. Now he had opened the PPT. I didn't send the PPT. This is so much better. Elasticator. If I want to test it, yeah, give me a second. Yeah, yeah. Give me a second.
instead ideas worth spreading the wise only possess ideas the great part of mankind
Testing, testing. Okay, voice is sounding okay. Okay, I'm starting. Huh? Is this better? Is this better? Or is that, that was better? <laughs> you better hope it's symmetrical. Okay. I'm moving. And it's not possible to bring that closer for me to see. How do we check that? Or just tilt the, tilt the, yeah, yeah, that's perfect. But can you tilt it forward? The screen. Not that much, not that much. Throw it back. Throw it back, 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 throw it back. There. That's perfect. <laughs> what did you just say? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm starting. So I'm standing this way. <coughs> then why is that there? Then put that there, no? Ah, because I can't read. Then I'll be looking here, sir. Understood, understood. So we'll verify that once the video is done. Now take one shot. How do you know this? You want to move it? You decide. It's fine, it's just a crutch anyway. It's fine. Yes. Happy? Okay. Ready? Um, I spent the last part, la, 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 la. sorry, that sounded not like me. Okay, I spent a large part of the last 10 years as a designer, first as an architect at Mumbai University, and then as a designer, of, I have to stand in one place. What are these rules? <laughs> Why are you giving this? <laughs> okay, fine, fine. I'll, okay, no, I'm, not, I'm not doing a dry run. I'm not doing a dry run. I'm not doing a dry run. Okay, 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 okay. Why don't I work with transitions with you? So I spend a large part of, I, I'll just run through it because I don't want my voice to go again. It's back. So, um, okay. I spent a large part of the last 10 years as an architect in Mumbai University, following which I ended up as an urban designer at Harvard University and then did my ecologies degree. I now work as, a, as an urban designer at a firm called Sasaki, which works globally on transforming urban spaces. What I'm trying to get at here is that um, I've spent a long time as a designer, and I've realized that we have certain frameworks and ways of thinking that I think are extremely impactful and useful to everyone else as well. However, these are things that we don't often share. When I was given the platform to do a TEDx talk, this is what I decided to talk about. 10 things I learned as a de designer I wish everybody knew. I will share these with you starting now, hopefully if my sore throat allows it. So let's go. The first and most important point I'd like to touch, oh. Okay. The first and most important thing I'd like to talk about is how you think matters. The process matters. Oftentimes we think there's one right solution. As a student of design, I'll tell you, that is absolutely untrue. Ever walk into a studio and see 80 people working on the same problem? That's what a design studio looks at. But each of those projects that those 80 people come up with are extremely different from each other. If that's not proof that there are multiple approaches, 
If that's not proof that there are multiple approaches to similar problems, what is? Once we start realizing that there's not a single right answer to every problem, you're gonna be more open to experimentation. Design is an iterative process. Iteration is the process of looking at a problem, producing lots of solutions to it, gaining feedback, responding to that, and then deploying one answer. Every model, every studio uh, desk that you see will have multiple small models on it. Some will be versions of earlier, early, earlier designs, other ones will be absolutely different. As designers, we learn very early on not to say no to ourselves. This is what I think it's important to take away from what I'm saying right now. Don't say no to yourself. How many of you in the audience have sat around and stopped yourself from asking a question, going somewhere, saying something that you wanted to because you didn't think it was perfect? One of my close professors once told me, perfection is the enemy of creativity. We're so busy holding, holding ourselves to, to unrealistic standards that we forget to try, to iterate, to be more creative. So I'm gonna tell you how you think matters, not what you think. Deepak Palotra, my professor at business school once told me, the world's not looking for the correct answers, it's looking for compelling arguments. Are you making those? That's what I'm asking you today. This brings me to my second point. Do it for one minute. I was put on the spot, so. I'm moving around a lot. Got it. Okay, let's start. Please, keep your video. Oh, you shifted this also device. Oh, okay. Acha. Take care. And then. Um, I have this. I don't know. <laughs> Wait, this is not working. This is not working. This it's not working. <laughs> Is that? No, I'm saying you start. Uh, okay. Um, okay, let's do a quick try run. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, hope you're doing well. I see that I'm addressing a class of uh, class nine to twelve students. Very interesting and precious years, right? Um, you must have received advice from everyone around you telling you what to do. So today we have this talk where we want to encourage you to think what you want so that you don't conform to societal norms, you don't come under peer pressure, but you actually think about what you want to do. Why be a follower when you can be an influencer, or rather, a leader? So, uh, first of all, let's talk about herd mentality. 
Uh, I'm sure some of you would have heard this phrase. Well, Wikipedia describes, this, uh, describes it as the notion where you follow a group's thoughts and behaviors so as to fit in. Yes, obviously, it reduces the cognitive load of actually having to think, but it takes away from your own individuality, your strengths and weaknesses, which only you're aware of. Okay? Good? Okay.
All of you all. Yeah, you all stick around here. Let the others film it in. Come in front. Yeah, just, just take an entire row. Yeah, boys can take that row. Yeah, girls can sit in this row and the boys can sit on the row ab above it. And uh, we can have the faculty members in the middle also. Yes, good, good afternoon audiences. We will be starting off very shortly. Um, we are actually shooting this entire session as per pure TEDx guidelines, which actually talks about 100 members in the audience. Uh, there will be sections where we will be panning the camera to the audience as well, because we are meeting the criteria for sure. Okay, so we request you all not to be spread out the way you all are spread out right now. Please come to the front. Uh, we since we are going to be moving uh, the cameras, we want to make sure that these 100 members who are a part of the crowd are not being, I mean, we are able to. comes up to me and says, oh, I really like your skin color. I'm like, what? My skin color? I was a little mind blown, to say the least. And then I discovered that, you know, these white people crave for some color on their skin. This is what the US self tanning market looks like. They spend millions, like millions of dollars in gels, lotions, just to add some color to their skin. If you look at it, more than $200 million are spent, which is more than 1,600 crore rupees. Isn't that crazy that that's what the other side of the world thinks like, uh, looks like, whereas we think that you need to be fair to be lovely. 
So that's number one. Let's move on. Uh, number two, so now we move on to the consequential people in your life. How to recognize your support system and make sure you talk to them and actively communicate with them. Obviously, you have your friends who, you know, are a place where you feel safe and probably the keeper of your deepest, darkest secrets. But at this stage in life, your parents and your teachers are extremely valuable. So make sure you communicate your wishes, desires, interests, likes and dislikes with them. Uh, typically, they are the ones who will lift you up and make sure you reach the highest possible goal that you've set for yourself. Uh, I have been very lucky to have uh, very, very supportive parents. Um, I am the eldest child of the eldest children. So when I decided that I am going to step out of the country and pursue computer engineering, where typically what was happening in the previous generation was women getting basic education and then me married off, some heads were turned. So much so that a senior member of my family didn't talk to my mom for a year. But my parents still stood be behind me and supported me in my decisions. I do think that our parents make a lot of sacrifices in life. So if you have your parents around you, or maybe today when you go back home, just write them a thank you note or say thank you, because as the stalwart Taylor Swift says, it really can be exhausting rooting for the anti-hero. So this is number two. Moving on, we will talk about pushing boundaries and seeking diverse experiences. I really encourage you to be curious and to take risks because unless you do, you take these steps, you're unable to realize your full potential. And what I mean by that is uh, if you're a science student, take a sociology class. If you like arts, maybe try an interior designing internship. Or you know what, travel and talk to a person that you've never spoken to before because that will help you uh, understand different uh, perspectives. So I understand this can be really, really daunting. Um, when I first stepped out of my house for boarding school at the age of 15, within the first three months, I called up my parents and I'm like, why have you sent me here? I think we had better teachers back home. I had better facilities available to me. So why don't you just come pick me up? And then I took a couple of days and be like, okay, may maybe give me a month and we'll talk about this again. And I'm so glad I decided against going back because it really was the start of my journey. I stepped out of the city, then outside the country and finally outside the continent and that opened so many doors for me. So this is approximately what my journey has looked like. I have studied in three countries, worked in five industries and probably been in teams, teams with tens of nationalities with varied experiences, ages and backgrounds. I have discovered so much. I have learned that uh, in a team, I love to be the one setting up structure and processes, uh, just hearing people's diverse opinions and you know, based on the culture and the backgrounds they, they come from has made me a better listener and made me more open. And I've also discovered random things like social media websites use blue in their logos because that instills trust. So once you open the door for new experiences, you really don't know what's in store for you. For someone coming like me who was taught three different pronunciations of envelope, if she can stand in front of you and deliver a TEDx talk, I'm sure the possibilities are endless. Moving on, failure. I know a lot of you will probably be so scared of this word. And we do everything possible in our life to avoid any kind of disappointments or failures. But it's eventually meant to happen because unless you experience some lows, how will you enjoy the highs in your life? Um, I learned this pretty late. Um, in 2016, I, at the age of 23, 
got into Cornell, uh, the Cornell MBA program, getting into an Ivy League university at the age of 23 when the average age for the business school program is 28. I just was like beyond words. I was on cloud nine, unaware of like what was, what was in store for me and what struggles lie ahead. Um, as Nelson Mandela rightly said, the greatest glory uh, does not lie in never falling, but just after, but just in terms of rising after every fall that you have. He was a very smart guy. He led a movement to, you know, fight social justice. So I'm sure we can give him some credit. Also, um, this is what social media has taught us that life is an onward and upward journey full of happiness. So I'm just gonna use a typical Instagram versus reality meme to tell you that actually life is a comedy of errors. So just get ready for whatever's to come. Anyway, coming back to my story. So I entered uh, the university. I excelled at uh, studies. I graduated with distinction. I was in all extracurriculars you can think of. I still am on the Cornell homepage. My face is still there, but I was unaware that because I was not average, I was I had to clear a higher bar. For the job market, I was competing with my peers who had up to eight years worth of more experience than I did. And we both graduated from the same school, DPS Archipram, but one was eight years older than me, and we were both sitting in the McKinsey interview together looking at each other like, yeah, I'm like, yeah, I know what's gonna happen here. Anyway, I struggled my way through it, uh, literally worked my socks off, and got a job in an industry of my choice. But uh, so much so that dest what destiny had in store, it had already decided. The Trump administration refused to give me a visa. And trying to protect my self-confidence and self-worth, I decided to come back, which turned out to be a, you know, a much better decision given what came after, which is a pandemic. So I was really happy that I was able to be with my family during that time. But, you know, sometimes, Life takes turns, and in spite of all, of all your efforts, you fail, not knowing what's in store for you ahead. So just take every failure with a pinch of salt and obviously learn from it. Number five. So yes, we are at the final stage of these lessons. Number five is just to be kind and enable others. Um, I am a big believer in bu building a positive ecosystem and I have seen empathy play out in front of me. Now, whether that be me saying thank you to, my, to the waiter at my neighborhood restaurant and him ending up remembering my order next time, or me just being curious about someone's profession and later realizing that he's a renowned neuroscientist who wants to connect with me on LinkedIn. So I just uh, understood that kindness and empathy have, will go a long, long way. Um, I have made sure I mentored my friends, family, and the community around me. But last year, I took the decision of quitting my job and doing this full time. So now, this is what I do. Um, I teach practical skills at schools, uh, ranging from to how to tell your story to how to build your own venture. And uh, the idea is to provide mentorship to students so that they can you know, further uh, in a, build a path for their higher education and they go, achieve their goals. Um, so this, these are some shots from my first workshop. And uh, this is the feedback I received. Um, and it, life comes a full circle. If you're being kind, the universe will empower you. Um, as a millennial, reading a Gen Z saying that, you know, they really like my vibe, I feel I did my generation proud. Obviously, as you can see, they learned something about entrepreneurship as well. But to me, that was the highlight of my experience. Um, so all I want to say at the end of the day is it's important for you to find your voice, write your own story, and build your path. And while you do that, just inspire others, break barriers, 
and make sure you build a world where everyone can embrace their own individuality and don't scared don't be scared to be yourself thank you i'll just leave you at it thank you shreya now may i request principal sir to honor shreya with the memento Thank you principal sir now may i request mr ananj prasad to have a brief session with shreya i think that was a very inspirational story a topsy turvy journey with so many key takeaways for everyone involved i think a lot of you in your senior grades can take so much of perspective across so many different eras of shreya's life and of course a story which is still being written with many success stories and that reality curve that you see right there shreya i'd like to ask you uh, you know there have been a lot of ups and downs you know for many people getting into cornell university as you mentioned um, cornell for those who are uh, not informed about it yet is one of the most prestigious ivy league universities in the world and uh, on a lighter note is the best university in the world because both shreya and i belong to it <laughs> but uh, getting into these kinds of universities actually uh, is considered a gold standard one of the most aspirational things and it's often considered a doorway to success but many times things don't pan out the way we have planned them like shreya spoke about them and then of course we have those downs so in those kinds of situations and you've been through a couple of them shreya how have you been able to pull yourself up and make sure that you're able to move to the next step Uh, I think that's a great question. Thanks, Anand. Uh, you know, I can be very comfortable in terms of describing this is the path I adopted. One, two, three is what I take. But when you first face such a setback, you just take a couple of months or a couple of weeks off. You just figure how things have been and what have you learned. And eventually, you realize that this experience was never meant to be to achieve a certain goal. It was always an enabler so it help you build different kind of skills gain different perspectives which you can actually implement in multiple scenarios so for example when i say holistic university then you aim to refine your soft skills as well as your hard skills so that maybe if one day you can you know get to a leadership position um these are essentially just brands which in the indian market if you we were to talk about this context are used to validate whether you're worthy of like you know getting an interview at a job or not but after getting that interview it's still you who has to make it there and honestly i know so many people who without these brands have networked their way into companies formed relationships i mean even if we look back at school right uh, like we thought that the nerds and the front benchers would become the steve jobs of tomorrow but that last venture sitting there was actually making a whole network and some of the so called non studious people in my school were the first ones to actually start a company so at the end of the day it's all about who do you think you are if you are a social person then i personally would not say that you know conform to societal norms and push yourself towards an iit or a name pursue the degree that you are interested in there are different courses that have come up for example there's this ipm course that i am in door has launched a lot of uh, uh, du co uh, courses now focus on soft skills as well even if you go for economics etc and obviously global universities have like a ton of electives if you do decide to enroll for them where they're not only focusing on building your core skill set but also allowing you to like i said seek a set of diverse experiences we had that wine class and the ski class and the salsa right. class uh that we had the opportunity of taking so at the end of the day it's just about how do you want to how do you see yourself growing 
in a certain direction. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for that, Shreya. Uh, any words of encouragement for our young audience as well as all of the adults here, which would probably encourage them to come and be a part of this platform on this side? Yeah, definitely. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, unless you try pushing those boundaries and getting out of your comfort zone, you're always going to stay in that bubble. Uh, so even if you think your ideas are not fully formed, when you speak them out loud, uh, you realize certain things that you that that idea staying inside might not have you know made you realize. So just try, and there's no harm trying because we're all in a safe space. You are aware of your peers, your classmates, your schools. I'm sure SOAR offers a very very collaborative environment here. So. Just try, push your uh, boundaries and help each other develop, that's all. Thank you so much, Shreya. Give her a good, big round of applause from Ludhiana to DPS RK Puram to Singapore to New York City and then a bunch of other places in US back to India and now sharing a lot of perspective in Raipur. I'm sure it comes with a lot of light which I hope will shine on all of you. Thank yes. you so much. Thank you. Like my mom says, Lord ke buddhu gar ko hai. So. Thank you, Anand sir and Shreya for a wonderful session. Not all the stars are in the sky. We have few with us. Yes, Ashna Khandelwal, a 12th grader at Bhavan's Akeshada Vidya Mandir, Raipur, will be soon flying out with the colors into the world of reality. She has, she has a bright mind with optimistic views and is a creative personality. She has her own definition of life and is an enthusiast in innovating new ideas and has her own interest in socializing. With a great academic excellence, she achieved 96% in her 10th grade. She is also determined towards her aim. Apart from being a scholar, she is a taekwondo player. Not to forget, she has a mesmerizing voice. She was also one of the invitees at the 46th Jawaharlal Nehru National Science, Mathematics and Environmental Exhibition held on October 2019. Today, Ashna is enlightening us on Indian education system. So without having much delay, we have the star on the stage Ashna Khandelwal. Vidya Dadati Vinaya, Vinayad Yati Patrata, Patratvat Dhanma Proti, Dhanat Dharmam Tata Sukha. Greetings to one and all present here. I am Ashna Khandelwal. I am a commerce student from class 12th and I am 17 years old. To be more precise, in 24 days I will be 18. Now when I take a look back at the 18 years of my life, the first memories that flash in front of my eyes at an instant are of my school. Now in these 18 years, the first 4 years were leisure time, of which I hardly remember anything. While the next 14 years, when I gained awareness, I was at school, educating myself. Now these memories didn't come up first because I'm about to part my ways with the school, I'm getting nostalgic or exams are approaching. But this is the result of me actually dedicating so much of my time and of course my parents' money to education. It is through the process of introspection that is a gift to me from education that I have somehow been able to understand and relate to the meaning of the shloka that I used at the beginning of my speech. Remember, to make it more clear and to elongate my speech a little, let me help you with the meaning. So the shloka means knowledge enhances your life with discipline leading to, uh, which instills within you worthiness, leading to inflow of wealth. This wealth is then utilized to do good deeds and experience joy and contentment thereafter. Beautiful, isn't it? I mean, this clearly, this clearly exemplifies how important knowledge is in our lives. Moving on, so tell me, how many of you know about marketing strategy? I can see, so let me help you further. There is this toothpaste producing company who attempted to boost up its sales and so hired a PR team. Now this PR team came up with five really good solutions out of which one was picked. Are you excited to know what it was? Well it was to enlarge the size of the hole on the tube. When more toothpaste comes out, the tube finishes quicker and the buyer will have to buy a new tube faster. Smart, isn't it? That's how a strong theoretical base helps you find its practical uses everywhere. However, after some time, you don't even need to find it. 
everything tends to make sense automatically and that's when i stopped looking at the toothpaste just as one but more like a marketing marvel that was biz that was marketing from business studies that we are taught in the name of education so what do you think is education education is the process of intensifying learning knowledge acquisition value and virtue acquisition now it also facilitates the improvement of individuals all around the world moreover it has always been and will always be a very integral component of every society it has evolved over time with changing demands to steer towards being a worthwhile process and inculcate lifelong learning in the next few minutes we shall take a tour to ancient india wherein we'll be exploring certain education systems what they were and their relevance is currently now education in india has witnessed several ups and downs and still is known as one of the biggest and a very well known system in the world firstly talking about the gurukul system now this was a system of schooling a uh -uh, a system of learning wherein children willing to learn went to their guru's house jungles ashrams or anywhere close to nature to inculcate a feeling of brotherhood humanity love and discipline children there experienced a holistic development that is spiritual mental and physical accompanied by moral values cultural knowledge life skills and survival skills children in gurukul generally studied education that was based on vedas scriptures uh, epics literature and etc etc subjects that it included was economics political science architecture mathematics metaphysics etc etc the list is too long children were trained to become self reliant with the quality of the education that they received here following these gurukuls we had some higher educational institutions which comprised of some really well known universities like takshashila nalanda vallabhi etc the main aim of these universities was the overall development of students it also focused and uh, more wait how many of you know that there is this legend that nalanda university was demolished approximately 9 million volumes and manuscripts were burnt when the library was set on fire while it took 3 months for the library to completely burn down then we had maktabs and madrasas now maktabs were centers of primary knowledge where children learned reading and writing while they were then promoted to madrasas which were centers of higher learning which generally focused on religion and inculcation of qualities like leadership and of course after this we had the colonial government in the 1830s lord thomas bamington macaulay introduced to india the english language and the so called modern education system whose basic aim was to subserve colonial interest and to produce clerks of course as time passed we moved we moved to the the new era the 21st century the era of sciences the era of technology and that of innovations talking about the education system currently edu being educated is a factor that affects one's socio economic situation adversely the current education system includes schools colleges university and some independent institutions of course however the aim of education has altered so profoundly that we no longer value intelligence intellect knowledge any sort of aesthetic feeling or some sort of spiritual attainments but it is only the economical success that we acknowledge moreover young child's capability of memorizing brings them recognition everyone is in a rat race competing against each other however not everything about the system is bad we are prone to more opportunities more exposure we got internet we have got connectivity education has become more accessible to masses however certain takeaways from the formal systems of education would just do wonders like the bond that teachers and students shared in the medieval time was really sacred and pure this might help children coping up with their stress in the current times equal importance was given to curriculars and co-curriculars and more of practical knowledge and skill based learning would enhance the education system furthermore the fact that high quality education was prioritized in old times 
further supports the idea that the sole purpose of education is to impart knowledge. Swami Vivekananda once said, education is not the amount of information put into human brain. It must have man making, character making and life building assimilation of ideas. Then only by the means of that education, something can be gained in the world. Now, when as time passed, education systems tend to develop. Then, uh, like I mentioned earlier, I am a commerce student and I am very habituated of having case studies all around me. So, I couldn't restrict myself and ended up studying about the Japanese education system. In fact, our Prime Minister, Mr. Narendra Modi, also said one, in one of his interviews that our education system should learn something from that of the Japanese. Now, Japan is a country which enhances and focuses more on human capital enhancements than on rote learning. One of the very significant features of Japanese education system is that, apart from imparting knowledge within students, it allows them to, make, to be loyal to their culture and tradition. It is due to this reason that Japanese calligraphy, poetry, etc. are taught to students even after the school hours so that they are in touch with their culture and tradition. Additionally, activities like mopping, cleaning, chopping, weaving, etc. are taught to them as a part of their curriculum, making them exclusive. Super! So kudos to them. Driving back to India, talking about education, one cannot overlook the new education policy 2020, right? Now, the policy is sought to be one of the most required reforms and a very important reform of current times. The policy aims at making education accessible to all. Changes are to be made in the curriculum, making it more holistic. And there won't be any hard segregations between arts and sciences, curriculars and co-curriculars, while academic and vocational subjects. However, this policy, if implemented right, is capable of doing wonders and can make India the golden sparrow once again, where we consider knowledge to be the real wealth. Additionally, uh, encouraging library culture, inquiry sessions, sports, some other forms of art, skill-based learning, etc. will add up to the grace of the education system now and the ones that are still to come. Going back in times is obviously impossible. However, incorporating its glimpses in the present isn't that impossible, is it? People are going back in times, be it through becoming vegan or yoga, Ayurveda, meditation or bell bottoms and wide legs. Something that we should never forget is that we are Indians and we are capable enough of doing anything and everything. That's my time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ashna. Now, may I request Principal Sir to honor Ashna with, with, with the memento. Thank you, Principal Sir. May I request Anand Sir to have an enlightening session with Ashna. Ashna, there was a great talk actually, uh, which you. took us down the entire history of education in India and also talked about uh, education in some of the other countries in Asia across the world and what we can borrow from them, what we can learn from them. I have an interesting question for you. Uh, you talked about these different phases of education, starting off with Takshila, Nalanda, then moving to the period of Madarsas. Then we talked about Lord Macaulay and the introduction of English to probably make us as Indians a little more civilized. And uh, then, of course, we went to the post-independence era and this era of education that you are in today. I want to ask you, among all of these phases of education, if you were given an opportunity to go back in time, which period would you like to be a part of and why? Uh, can I make certain changes in any of the system? Like little changes? Yes, yes, go ahead. Now, 
I would really want to experience the Gurukul system of education. However, it had many drawbacks, but we of course discussed the good things and the things that we can incorporate in the current world. But these Gurukul systems, they provided a holistic knowledge and a practical based knowledge, which not only confined you to textbooks, but also help you experience the outer world, the world outside books. So maybe the Gurukul system. Yeah. Okay, the Gurukul system of learning, which actually was pervasive for so many years. And if you go back and read a little bit about the history of education, you will learn about how the Gurukul systems were slowly and steadily eroded and then eradicated during the late 1800s. It's very interesting actually to learn about how India's cultural education system was killed for multiple reasons. Right. Anyway, moving on, uh, another question that I'd like to ask you is that if there's one thing that you'd like to change in today's education system, more than anything else, what more would you More than want? anything else? Well, um, I mean, education, people now, teachers nowadays are getting educated. However, there are many un, uh, unrecognized parts of the country and recognized parts as well, wherein completion of syllabus is uh, considered to be a priority for teachers rather than imparting knowledge in students. So I think that is the one thing that will really help in mass enhancements. Perfect, perfect. Sounds great. Sounds great. So just basically going off the syllabus right. and not always focusing on completion of the syllabus. Right. One last question. Any words of encouragement for our young adults as well as adult members of the audience that would allow them to probably come on the stage next year? Right, that's a big responsibility. But uh, one thing that you should never fear is what people will think after you say anything. Because if people talk behind your back, there's a reason that they're behind you, right? Now, when I say this, I know a lot of people might have not liked my speech. A lot might have liked my speech. They'll do, uh, they'll do acknowledge me for that. But uh, something that I would want to tell is at the end of the day, I gave a TED talk and I will be recognized as a TED speaker. So everything else just is overshadowed by me being a TED speaker now. So yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Please give her a big round of applause. Thank I you. think more than anything else, we need to appreciate her confidence. The entire method of delivery, I think it was absolutely fabulous. The world's your oyster, Ash. Go. Thank you. Go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anand sir and Ashna. Lehro se dar kar nauka paar nahi hoti. Lehro se dar kar nauka paar nahi hoti. Koshish karne walo ki haar nahi hoti. Koshish karne walo ki haar nahi hoti. Jab tak na safal ho, neen chen ko tiyago tum. Jab tak na safal ho, neen chen ko tiyago tum. संघर्ष का मैदान छोड़कर मत भागो तुम संघर्ष का मैदान छोड़कर मत भागो तुम कुछ किए बिना ही जय जयकार नहीं होती कुछ किए बिना ही जय जयकार नहीं होती कोशिश करने वालों की कभी हार नहीं होती कोशिश करने वालों की कभी हार नहीं होती सोहनलाल द्विवेदी जी की यह कविता खरी उतरती है श्री अभय कुमार सिंह पर जो वर्तमान में भारतीय राजस्व सेवा में प्रधान आयकर निदेशक के पद पर रायपुर में कार्यरत हैं श्री अभय कुमार सिंह जी भारतीय राजस्व सेवा के उन्नीस बैच के अधिकारी हैं इन्होंने विभिन्न पदों पर अपनी सेवाएं मुंबई दिल्ली बेंगलुरु आदि शहरों में दी है ऐसे अतिथि का स्वागत करते हुए हमें गर्व महसूस हो रहा है मैं आमंत्रित करती हूं माननीय श्री अभय कुमार सिंह जी को कि वे अपने प्रेरणादायक विचार इस मंच पर प्रस्तुत कर हमें अनुग्रहित करें
I think I am an odd man out in this whole program because this is the program for the youth. But uh, I am hopeful that my speech uh, will be <coughs> for the greater benefits of not only the youth here present, but uh, all and sundry. <coughs> the topic, my topic is Shabd Samarthya. Now I will start my topic. My topic will be Shabd Samarthya. Shabd ye mano jati ke saath uski ek aisi khasiyat hai, uski aisi vishesta hai jo itar jeev jantuon mein nahi paya jata hai. Hum aadmi hi shabdo ke madhyam se aapas mein communicate karte hai. Janwaru ke beech mein jo communication hota hai उसमें उनकी आवाजें तो होती हैं लेकिन वो शब्द का रूप नहीं होता उसमें कोई स्ट्रक्चर नहीं होता आदमी अपनी बुद्धि के लिए जाना जाता है जबकि जंतु जगत के अन्य प्राणी संबुद्धि या इंट्यूशन से या उसे सहज बुद्धि कहते हैं सहज बुद्धि से गाइडेड होता है जब हम ये कहते हैं शब्द और सामर्थ्य तो ये सामर्थ्य किसकी है और शब्द सामर्थ्य को दोनों अगर एक साथ लें तो सामासिक रूप में ये मानवता का ये मानवता का सामर्थ्य है क्योंकि मानवों ने अपने आदिम काल से यहाँ तक का जो सफ़र हासिल किया है उसमें शब्दों की अहम भूमिका है ये शब्द ही हमारे विचार को एक दूसरे के बीच न केवल संप्रेष बनाते हैं जब हम अपनी बात को रख सकते हैं बल्कि इनमें ये क्षमता है जो हमारी कल्पना और सपनों को भी शब्द के तौर पर एक आकार दे सकते हैं जहाँ तक इस सामर्थ्य की बात है मनुष्य के पास दो तरह की अभिव्यक्ति के संकट हैं एक तो बुद्धि पक्ष का संकट जिसमें लॉजिक है विज्ञान है और किसी बात को या दैनंदिन जीवन की चर्चा है उसे वो अपने बुद्धि के आधार पर कहता है उसका एक दूसरा पक्ष भाव पक्ष है या उसे हृदय पक्ष भी कहते हैं और वह जिसमें उसकी सारी संवेदनशीलता है उसके सड विकार हैं उसके भय हैं क्रोध है चिंता है और इस तरह की वो सारी सारी भावनाएँ हैं जो सूक्ष्मता को धारण किए हुए हैं मानवों के पास अभिव्यक्ति का जो आयाम है वो स्थूल से सूक्ष्म के बीच का आयाम है इसलिए शब्दों की समर्थता शब्दों का सामर्थ्य हमारे लिए बहुत ही महत्वपूर्ण है हम ऐसा कह सकते हैं यदि हम इतिहास देखें या आज तक मानवों ने जो जो उनकी सभ्यता का सिविलाइजेशन की जो यात्रा रही है अगर उसे देखें तो उस आधार पर हम कह सकते हैं कि जिस जाति ने जिस समाज ने जिस देश ने शब्द की मर्यादा को बनाए रखा उसने ज़्यादा प्रगति की हम यह भी कह सकते हैं कि जो समाज जो देश शब्द में धनी है वह धनी है शब्द से हीन शब्द से दरिद्र समाज भी दारिद्र को ही धारण करेगा उसमें दरिद्रता रहेगी इसलिए ये शब्द की जो समर्थता है और शब्द के जो प्रयोग हैं ये सामर्थ्य सिर्फ एक डिक्शनरी नहीं है कुछ शब्दों को जान लेना ही उसकी चुनौती नहीं है कि कुछ शब्दों को जान लिया और उसे उसका इस्तेमाल कर रहा है बल्कि उस सामर्थ्य को वहाँ तक ले जाना है जहाँ उसने अपने सपनों को जो उसने देखे हैं मानव जाति ने देखे हैं उसको साकार रूप तक लाए मैं राष्ट्र कवि दिनकर की एक कविता भी आपके सामने उद्धारित करूँगा संभवतः वो आपको एक ऐसा फलक देगा जिस पर आप इस बात को और अच्छी तरह से समझ पाएंगे कविता का शीर्षक है चांद और कवि चांद चूँकि हमारे काफ़ी समीप है सारे जीव होता है कभी किसी दिन एक सपना देखा होगा जब किसी गलते हुए जंगल के आग में गले हुए मिनरल से 
जब लोहा जैसा कोई पदार्थ बना होगा लोहा हमारी ठोस सभ्यता का प्रतीक है उसका प्रतिबिंब है वो भी किसी के सपने से ही आया होगा एक बहुत ही मशहूर उदाहरण है एक केकुले थे साइंटिस्ट थे जो कि ऑर्गेनिक केमिस्ट थे और उस समय उनके सामने एक चुनौती थी कि बेंजीन एक साइक्लिक कंपाउंड है या एक लॉन्ग चेन एलिफैटिक कंपाउंड है या एक क्लोज चेन कंपाउंड है और उसमें वो काफ़ी उलझे हुए थे तभी अचानक रात में उनके मन में एक सपना आता है और सपने में बहुत सारे सांप आते हैं तभी अचानक एक सांप अपनी पूछ को मुंह में पकड़ लेता है उसी समय उनकी नींद खुलती है और उन्होंने उसके बाद जो बेंजीन का स्ट्रक्चर दिया वो जो हेक्सागोनल बेंजीन का जिसमें कि वो चेन बंद होता है वहीं से उसकी शुरुआत होती है तो मानवता ने अब तक जो भी हासिल किए हैं उसका मुकाम उन सपनों से आया है महान वैज्ञानिक अल्बर्ट आइंस्टीन के बारे में भी बोलते हैं कि जब उन्होंने रिलेटिविटी की थ्योरी पर सोचना शुरू किया तो उनको एक सपना ही तो आया था उस समय तो लोगों को इतने मूवमेंट्स और रिलेटिव जो मूवमेंट है उसकी कल्पना करना भी उनके लिए मुश्किल था और उस सपने को उन्होंने बाद में उसके पश्चात ए इजल टू एम सी स्क्वायर के अपने एक महान फार्मूले में उसको संगठित किया जिसे आज पूरी दुनिया जानती है दुनिया के जितने भी महानतम आविष्कार हुए जितनी भी महानतम रचनाएं आईं उनका कहीं ना कहीं ऑरिजिन एक सपने से रहा है तो मैंने बोला किंतु मेरी राग नहीं बोली चांद फिर से देख मुझको जानता है तू स्वप्न मेरे बुलबुले हैं और पानी भी आग को भी क्या नहीं पहचानता है तू क्या उस सपने की आग को तुम नहीं समझते हो चांद आदमी का स्वप्न क्या है आदमी का स्वप्न क्या है बुलबुला जल का आज बनता और फिर कल फूट जाता है तो वो कहता है किंतु तो भी धन्य ठहरा आदमी ही तो बुलबुलों से खेलता कविता बनाता है मैं न वह जो स्वप्न पर केवल सही करते मैं न वह जो स्वप्न पर केवल सही करते आग को उसमें गला लोहा बनाता हूँ और रखता हूँ नए फिर नीव घर की इस तरह दीवार फौलादी उठाता हूँ सभ्यता की फौलादी दीवार विज्ञान की इतनी अहम प्रगति यह सब उन सपनों के स्रोत से आए हैं और उन सपनों को शब्दों की मर्यादा में बांधने की जिन्होंने क्षमता दिखाई उस शब्द के सामर्थ्य को दिखाया आज वही हमारे पथ प्रदर्शक हैं और उन्हीं की राह पर दुनिया चल रही है चाहे वह कविता का क्षेत्र हो विज्ञान का क्षेत्र हो धर्म का क्षेत्र हो स्पिरिचुअलिटी हो फिलासफी हो हम सब जानते हैं कि यूरोप में जो बहुत बड़े फिलासफर कांड थे हैगल थे उन्होंने किस तरह यूरोप की दशा और दिशा को बदल दिया उनके शब्दों के अंदर में क्या सामर्थ्य थे उनके क्या अद्भुत विचार थे फिर वो कहता है कि चांद तुमने तो मनु को देखा है मनु नहीं मनुपुत्र है मनु नहीं मनुपुत्र है यह सामने जिसकी कल्पना की जीव में भी आग होती है मनु नहीं मनुपुत्र है जनरेशंस बदल गए हैं मनु नहीं मनुपुत्र है यह सामने जिसकी कल्पना की जीव में भी आग होती है बाण ही होते विचारों के नहीं केवल स्वप्न के भी हाथ में तलवार होती है द कटिंग एज ऑफ सिविलाइजेशन इज द ड्रीम सप्न स्वप्न के हाथ में तलवार का होना मतलब स्वप्न इतना वायवीय है स्वप्न इतना सूक्ष्म है लेकिन उस ठोस सभ्यता को धारित करने की तमाम क्षमता उस सपने के अंदर से ही जागृत होती है और उसको पकड़ने की जो क्षमता है वो शब्द के सामर्थ्य से आता है स्वर्ग के सम्राट को जाकर खबर कर दे चांद तुम तो स्वर्ग के ज़्यादा समीप हो ऐसा हम मानते हैं कि जो ऊपर है स्वर्ग भी ऊपर है तो संभवतः चांद उससे करीब होगा स्वर्ग के सम्राट को जाकर खबर कर दे रोज ही आकाश चढ़ते जा रहे हैं ये रो किए जैसे बने इन स्वप्न वालों को स्वर्ग की ही ओर बढ़ते जा रहे हैं वे 
स्वर्ग के ही ओर बढ़ते जा रहे हैं ये जो मानो जो स्वप्नदर्शी है वो तो स्वर्ग के सम्राट को जाकर खबर कर दे मानव ने उसको निशाना बना रखा है और संभवतः एक दिन हम उन सब तमाम राज को जान सकेंगे जिसे स्वर्ग नामक किसी संस्था ने मानव से छुपा कर रखी है प्रकृति ने जिसे इस तरह से तत्व आवरण के बीच में छुपा रखा है छुपा दिए सब तत्व आवरण ने प्रकृति के नीचे लेकिन मानव ने अपने उद्यम से अपने सपने से और अपने विचार से उनको ढूंढ पाया सपना काफ़ी तरल है काफ़ी वायवीय है सपना जब थोड़ा सघन होता है तो कल्पना का रूप धारण करता है और कल्पना और सघन होकर हाइपोथिसिस का रूप लेता है आप सबको पता है कि थीसिस के पहले की जो अवस्था होती है वो हाइपोथिसिस होती है जिसे हिंदी में परिकल्पना कहते हैं और उसके बाद थीसिस बनता है थीसिस एक सिद्धांत को धारित करता है उस सिद्धांत को जब मैथमेटिकल मेजरमेंट में लाते हैं तो हमारी सभ्यता का एक आवश्यक अवयव बन जाता है उसका अंग बन जाता है लेकिन इन तमाम बातों के बीच में जो राष्ट्र कवि दिनकर ने अपनी कविता के माध्यम से रखा है इसमें मैंने पाया कि एक जो सामर्थ्य है शब्दों की सामर्थ्य है उसकी उसकी एक महान परंपरा चली आ रही है और आज वह चुनौती हमारे समाज में हमारे देश में और हमारे समकालीन समाज में एक भयानक चुनौती की तरह है जहां शब्द के संकट से शब्द के सामर्थ्य से पूरा समाज जूझ रहा है और यह अकारण नहीं है इतनी घृणा इतना विद्वेष इतने क्राइम यह सब जो हो रहे हैं ये अभिव्यक्ति का संकट है इसलिए कि आदमी अपनी भावनाओं को अपने षड विकार को जिसमें क्रोध है द्वेष है ईर्ष्या है घृणा है उसको व्यक्त करने के लिए संभावित शब्द नहीं उसके पास होते शब्दों का टोटा पड़ जाता है उसके सामर्थ्य की कमी होती है तभी समाज में एक इस तरह की जो एक कुटिलता आ रही है एक कदाचार आ रहा है और एक अनास्था का जो दौर चल रहा है समाज में जो आस्थाहीनता फैल रही है उसके पीछे मेरा एक दृढ़ मत है कि शब्द के सामर्थ्य की कमी है और मैं इसे एक अवसर के रूप में अपनी बात को सबके समक्ष रखना चाहता हूँ कि स्कूल हो कॉलेज हो समाज हो या जिसको कि महान ब्रिटिश एंथ्रोपोलॉजिस्ट ने कहा था जो ग्रेट ट्रेडिशन और लिटिल ट्रेडिशन की बात जो उन्होंने कही थी कि वो तमाम इंस्टीट्यूशन जो रेडक्लिप ब्राउन ने प्रोफेसर रेडक्लिप ब्राउन ने वो तमाम इंस्टीट्यूशन जो ग्रेट ट्रेडिशन के इंस्टीट्यूशन हैं जो मीडिया है जो बड़े बड़े जो यूनिवर्सिटीज़ हैं जो भाषाई संस्थान हैं उन सबों के समक्ष ये एक व्यापक चुनौती है कि इस इसको किस तरह लोगों के बीच में फैलाए शब्दों की मर्यादा को स्थापित करना समाज में पुनः एक मर्यादा को स्थापित करना है इसके बिना हम एक स्वच्छ और स्वस्थ समाज एक कल्पनाशील समाज एक स्वप्नशील समाज का निर्माण नहीं कर सकते धन्यवाद धन्यवाद सर आपके प्रेरणास्पद वचनों से हम सभी अनुग्रहित हुए अब मैं मंच पर आमंत्रित करती हूँ माननीय प्रिंसिपल सर को कि वे आए एवं भेंट स्वरूप प्रत्येक चिन्ह श्री अभय कुमार सिंह को प्रदान करें धन्यवाद सर मे आई रिक्वेस्ट मिस्टर अनंश प्रसाद टू हैव अ शॉर्ट सेशन विद मिस्टर अभय कुमार सिंह प्रणाम सर थैंक यू सो मच फॉर ग्रीसिंग दिस स्टेज सर मैं यही कहना चाहूँगा कि आपने ये हमें दिखा दिया कि शब्दों का सामर्थ्य क्या है <laughs> आपने जो हमें इतनी अद्भुत स्पीच uh, दिया ये मंच पे I am sure that it is going to be inspiring all of us, uh, sir. Uh, TED का मंच एक ऐसा मंच है जो basically बहुत सारे ideas को spread करने का प्रयास करता है. अब आपने एक ऐसे powerful idea के बारे में बात किया है, sir, जो often हम भूल जाते हैं इसके बारे में. Uh, जब हम शब्दों की सामर्थ्य के बारे में बात करते हैं, often uh, हमने ये देखा है कि हिंदी भाषा 
जैसे आपने कितने बढ़िया अलग अलग लाइन हमारे साथ शेयर किए ऑफन टाइम सर आज के बच्चों को या हमें भी इससे इतना एक्सपोजर नहीं मिल पाता है और ये हालांकि हमारी भी गलती है सर अगर आप हमें थोड़ा एडवाइस दे सकते हैं कि हम भी कहाँ से इस पर एक्सपोज हो पाएँ जैसे हम इंग्लिश मीडिया इतना हमें एक्सपोजर मिलता है जैसे हम निराला जी की बात करें या दिनकर जी की बात करें ये अलग अलग कवि हैं इनके शब्दों का सामर्थ्य है काफ़ी बार ऐसा भी हो जाता है कि हम तात्पर्य समझ नहीं पाते जिसकी वजह से सर कभी कभार हम देखना छोड़ देते हैं सर तो अगर आप थोड़ा इस पर विचार विमर्श करेंगे सर कबीर कहते हैं कि अगर अनुभूति की सघनता हो अगर अनुभूति हो तो भाषा उसमें कहीं भी बाधक नहीं है भाषा हिंदी हो अंग्रेजी हो जर्मन हो फ्रेंच हो कोई भी भाषा हो लेकिन जब अपनी आप को अपनी बात को जब कहना है इसके सबसे बड़े उदाहरण तुलसीदास हैं जिन्होंने एक अवधि जैसी बोली को वो भाषा भी नहीं है भाषा और बोली के बीच का अंतर है बोली का व्याकरण नहीं होता जब बोली का व्याकरण बन जाता है तो वही भाषा का स्वरूप लेता है क्योंकि भाषा उसके फॉर्म को स्ट्रक्चर कर देता है उसमें फिर डेविएसन नहीं होता है तो जो भी हम बोलते हैं या लिखते हैं वो दूसरे उसको एग्जैक्टली वही समझते हैं लेकिन तुलसीदास जी ने उन्होंने खुद ही रामचरित में अवधि को भदेश कहा है मतलब एक बोली है और उसमें रामचरित जैसे मानस की रचना की इतनी बड़ी इतना बड़ा एक ग्रंथ लिखा और मेरा मानना है कि संसार में शायद ही कोई ऐसा कवि पैदा हुआ होगा जो तुलसीदास का मुकाबला कर सकता है क्योंकि जिसे गाते हुए अरबों लोगों ने अपने सुख दुख हर्ष विषाद के क्षण उसमें व्यतीत किए हैं और उनकी पंक्तियों में अपने जीवन को जिस आस्था का आयाम दिया है वह एक बहुत बड़ा मार्ग प्रदर्शक है बालकांड के मंगलाचरण में ही वो कहते हैं वर्धना मर्थम संघा नाम रसा नाम छंद सामपी मंगला नाम च करता रहो वंदे वाणी विनायको तो वाणी और विनायक विनायक बुद्धि के देवता हैं वाणी सरस्वती वो हृदय पक्ष हैं जो हमने अपने प्रसंग में कहा था कि आदमी के पास दो पक्ष है एक बुद्धि का पक्ष है जो थोड़ा शुष्क है थोड़ा लॉजिकल है थोड़ा मैथमेटिकल है एक भाव का पक्ष है जिसमें तरलता है संवेदना है दूसरों के दुख को महसूस करने की उसमें क्षमता है तो वो सरस्वती जो हैं वो भाव पक्ष की देवी हैं अधिष्ठात्री देवी हैं और गणेश जो हैं विनायक वो बुद्धि पक्ष के हैं तुलसीदास जी उनको नमस्कार करते हैं क्योंकि वर्णों के संग से शब्द बनते हैं वर्ण से शब्द बनते हैं वर्ण और शब्द जो ध्वनि की एक ऐसी व्यवस्था है जैसे हमने कोई शब्द कहा गाय गाय या गाय एक ध्वनि है लेकिन हमने उसको एक ऐसा ट्रांसक्रिप्ट किया कि उसको गाय लिखा या काउ लिखा और उसमें आपने उस ऑब्जेक्ट का एक व्यू बना लिया शब्द सामर्थ्य में इस बात की भी है कि किस तरह से उस शब्दों के बीच में उसकी रूढ़ से हटकर एक शब्द एक रूढ़ हो जाता है उसका एक खास चलन हो गया उसी में नए अर्थ को कैसे भरें इसके लिए विद्यार्थियों को उस पर सोचना चाहिए और ये ज़्यादा उन ग्रेट ट्रेडिशन के इंस्टीट्यूशंस का रोल इसमें होगा जिनके हाथों में ये जिम्मेवारी है और अगर नहीं है तो उन्हें लेना चाहिए धन्यवाद धन्यवाद सर आ, सर जाने से पहले बस एक और आपसे दरख्वास्त है सर एक क्वेश्चन है टेडेक्स यूथ का जो मंच है आ, सर आ, आप ऑड मैन आउट आज उस पर है नहीं सर आप आज सबसे यूनिक जेंटलमैन हमारे साथ हैं क्योंकि दिस प्लेटफॉर्म है सर फॉर आइडियाज वर्थ स्प्रेडिंग स्पेशली अमंग द यूथ और शब्दों का जो सामर्थ्य है वो धीरे धीरे करके सर हम देख रहे हैं कि भूला जा रहा है इन जनरल हमारी लिटरेचर हमारी लैंग्वेज चाहे हिंदी हो है चाहे कोई भी भाषा हो कोई भी भाषा वो सिर्फ हिंदी पे एम्फोसिस नहीं बट कोई भी भाषा हो वो भूली जा रही है ये प्लेटफॉर्म जो है एक अपॉर्चुनिटी है कि ये जो आइडिया आप बोल रहे हैं इस पर हम और विचार करें उसको और स्प्रेड कर पाएँ एज एजुकेटर्स एज अ स्कूल ऑल्सो इस पर हम लोग और एम्फोसाइज करेंगे लेकिन अगर आप कुछ और बोलना चाहेंगे हमारे जो यूथ है हमारे जो बच्चे हैं और उसके अलावा जो टेड एक्स प्लेटफॉर्म है जो कर सकती है शब्दों के सामर्थ्य को बढ़ाने के लिए बिकॉज एट द एंड ऑफ द डे टेड का जो कॉन्सेप्ट है वो शब्दों के सामर्थ्य को ही यूटिलाइज uh, करने की कोशिश कर रहा है ताकि अलग आइडिया स्प्रेड हो पाएँ मैंने अपने बात कह, कह, कह दी है कि जो आइडिया हो वो ओरिजिनल हो वो आपके सपनों से आना चाहिए ये मैटर नहीं करता है कि कोई 
किस परिवेश में है कहाँ पढ़ा है कहाँ लिखा है हम तमाम इंसान जाति मानव जाति सबके पास यह एसेट है सबके पास यह संपत्ति है सभी सपना देखते हैं तो स्वप्न किसी की जागीर नहीं है स्वप्न किसी यूनिवर्सिटी किस किसी इंस्टीट्यूशन में बिकता नहीं है यह आपको अपने आप डेवलप करना पड़ता है यह आपकी अपनी संपत्ति है अपने सपनों पर गर्व करें और जैसे मैंने कहा कि स्वप्न काफ़ी तरल है वाइबीय है बहुत सूक्ष्म है उसको जब और सघन करते हैं उस पर सोचते हैं तो वह कल्पना का रूप धारण करता है और कल्पना से धीरे धीरे वो ठोस एक ऐसी सभ्यता में उतर कर आता है तो मौलिक चिंतन करें अपनी बात में मौलिकता लाएं और अपने सपनों को व्यक्त करें उसको पाने की एक इच्छा रखें और उस पर आगे बढ़ें हमारी यही शुभेच्छा है आप तमाम बच्चों के साथ आप जीवन में काफ़ी आगे बढ़ें बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद धन्यवाद सर लाइक ए पी जे अब्दुल कलाम सर ड्रीम 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 ट्रांसफॉर्म इन टू थाट्स एंड थाट्स इन टू एक्शन थैंक यू सो मच सर प्रणाम थैंक यू अनंत सर एंड अबे सर फॉर इंस्पायरिंग अस Here upon we have one more Bhavanite, Shristi Agrawal, a high school student, very dear to the teachers, quite submissive, but at the same time possesses an extraordinary leadership quality. It gives me immense proud to say that she is a good team player too. Shristi says that she is a social butterfly. She has earned a bronze medal in IGKO and participated in Green Olympiad and International Economics Olympiad. She has a perspective of seeing her world full of colors which even has made her earn first international rank in camel painting competition. It is said that comfort is the enemy of achievements. Let's explore from comfort to come forth with Srishti. Learning comes from experiences and experiences coming forth. It's easy to say grab your opportunities and learn from those. Do we all try to grab those opportunities? If yes, please raise your hands. The answer is actually no for the most. Opportunities are rare and when they are served in front of us, we are afraid to be spontaneous. This is because we are so comfortable confined within our boundaries that we are afraid of experiencing and learning something new. It feels so good to be comfortable with no anxiety and fear. Can we develop, grow and comprehend without voluntarily stepping forward? What is the root cause of our restrictions? We call this root cause our comfort zone. Comfort zone? Yes. Comfort zone is a psychological state of mind where everything feels so familiar to us. A stress free environment with no anxiety and fear without additional burden we are free to be ourselves everybody loves to hang on at the stage forever now you all might be wondering what about the stresses that we deal in our daily life isn't that stress dealt out of our comfort zone the answer is no we as students think that dealing with our Daily stresses related to our school work, our assignments, our extracurricular work is something enough for our growth and development. But this is not what brings you out of your comfort zone. These small spicy chunks are an inseparable part of life. Robert Yorkes, a renowned psychologist, has given the idea of optimal anxiety, where he stated that anxiety is important for for improvement of performance. until a certain level of arousal has been reached beyond that point the performance deteriorates as the anxiety levels increases for example a little amount of sugar is important for every body but when the level of sugar increases it brings you diabetes in the same way a little amount of anxiety is important to perform and to grow but as the level of anxiety increases people tends to worry which leads them to doing their work incorrectly this stress can be dealt with by working daily instead of piling up our work a little effort put in daily and there you are all sorted without last minute worries but are we all doing that no this is because we are somewhere afraid 
afraid of afraid of losing afraid of being made fun of afraid of doing those things wrongly or making wrong decisions regarding our choices in in this race in this race of hiding from difficulties we forget our capabilities in the vast competitive era of coming first we are afraid of losing which eventually pushes you back to your comfort zone a state where we won't feel like competing coming forward or referring to the audience the fear fear of being afraid fear of being made fun made fun of these fears bound us from coming forward now you all might be wondering what is the problem of us being in a comfort zone in my opinion there is by being in that state we fear coming forward which eventually hampers our growth and development a little if we stop fearing about the petty situations in our life and we could learn to tackle them easily but what about the more challenging ones to deal with these issues one must push his or her boundaries and perceive perceiving these issues and coping up with stress is something that builds a great personality it's not just about anxiety or fear or solving problems it's about it's about exploring your capabilities and strengths if a person has faith in himself that person can solve whatever problem that uh, that person faces for example albert einstein is a great scientist but when he was a child he was unable to speak until 4 and read until 7 and was also given a title of mentally handicapped but he never gave up and perceived and that's the reason why we know the most important theories that he gave that he gave us today now you all might be wondering why is this girl standing in front of us and talking about all the stuffs this is because i have gone through this phase and has realized the life is so much to offer out of our comfort zone I have I have always been a very shy girl who loved to be confined in her comfort zone. I never tried to step forward, come out of the crowd, take part in event or explore the things surrounding me. But and I realized this led me to nowhere until and unless I tried to push my limits, came come out of the cocoon that I have created surrounding myself for years. You all sitting there in the audience was once my comfort zone. But today I decided I stepped forward and this red spot this stage is what I call it my comfort zone It said room is not built in a day and this is also true for people The person cannot just suddenly decide oh today I'm going to come out of my comfort zone No it's not that it's tiny steps that leads you to a greater success It's all about exploring experiencing learning feeling coming back again and learning so it's never too late or never too early to start new the right time is when you realize you should being spontaneous and coming out stepping out requires courage and this courage can only be built when you try to push your limits beyond your capabilities people fall people fail but the one who who withstands this, this failure and learns from this failure is the most successful person in life so at the last i just want to say be courageous be confident come forth come out of your comfort zone and explore this beautiful world without being afraid thank you Now may I request principal sir to give the memento to Shristi
Thank you, sir. Thank you. We'll do well. Thank huh? you, sir. Now I request Anand sir to have a brief session with Shristi. Very well spoken, Shristi. Thank you, sir. The concept of comfort zones is something all of us are well acquainted with, isn't it? How many of us have a comfort zones? Is there actually someone here who doesn't have a comfort zone is a better question. That sounds about right. Shristi, can you share a little bit about your own comfort zones and how you've tried to get out of them? I, I always had a notion that let the things go how it is going and I never tried to uh, explore what I can do. I was always a girl, like a very shy girl to be confined somewhere at the corner or something. But uh, when I realized that no, this is not going to help you anywhere. You should explore, you should learn. That's when I realized that no, you have to do something. And that's what uh, recently I had been a part of an event where I actually got to know a lot about me. Like I was able to talk to people. I was able to express my ideas without being afraid. And that's when I realized that yes, my comfort zone doesn't, uh, is not something that I should stay in. I should come out and let the world know who I am. So that brings me to my next question. What got you to come forth then? Um, you can say it's something that, uh, the sound that comes from inside, that inner courage, inner voice that, tell, that told me that you have to do this. Like, I see people getting awards, getting their uh, certificates, coming, doing something really innovative, and that actually inspired me. Like, I had many my friends getting something out of the box and that what encouraged me to get something, do something. All right, thank you so much. Since, uh, you know, we have a wonderful student here who has really made a conscious effort to come out of her comfort zone, come forth in spite of a lot of internal resistance that she was facing. I'm sure that this in itself is a great example and should serve as an opportunity for all of you to think of those comfort zones which are preventing you from coming onto stage, from joining the basketball team, from joining the science exhibition fairs, from doing anything that you really want to, okay? Because I'll tell you one thing from my personal experiences as well, and I'm sure she will agree as well, um, that you know, uh, this time in school where you get all of these opportunities and are pushed into doing all of these opportunities, it'll probably never come back, okay? You go into college and from college times you are expected to be an autonomous learner. So you go into doing something that you are interested in. And unless you develop the confidence and gain the exposure in a school and especially in a school like Bhavans, you'll be wasting the opportunity more than anything else. If you don't do it in this school, then it's impossible to do so in college. Okay? So if you want to get out of your comfort zone, do it today because it gets more and more difficult every single day. Isn't it? Yes. All right, thank you so much with that. I gave my few words of so-called wisdom on this matter. Thank Is there you. anything that you'd like to share with your friends about this TEDx platform and this experience, this opportunity, getting prepared? Uh, this is something that cannot be put into words. This, are some, this is something that always overwhelmed me. I always, I always had that notion that I have to address, I have to do something that people remembers me. And this is the stage where I actually fulfilled one of my dreams and I'm really honored to be here to speak to public, to speak to you all sitting there and I would tell people to take courage, come forward and express your ideas. Thank you so much. Big round of applause for her, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Shishri. The topic of menstruation has always been surrounded by taboos and myths. Period to many means disgust, shame, and a source of embarrassment. Whereas it should actually mean strength, pride, and a source of empowerment. With period of pride, we aim to bring periods and menstrual hygiene management to the forefront. The challenge today is intensified due to the lack of knowledge about periods. Ria Jain is a student of 12th grade with immense potential and dedication. Gaining knowledge is an equipment to attain success. 
She has earned gold medal in IGKO and IEO. She was one of the top 20 individuals from India tinkering heads for an endeavor in social change making. She is a regular participant in debate competitions and has been also active in examinations like Technolathon. In Heritage Fest, she won special consolation in painting too. So here is Ria Jain, another Bhavanite on this humongous stage to make us proud. Awkward, shy, afraid, uncomfortable. This is how I felt after I got my first periods and this is how probably millions of girls feel when they start to menstruate. Now you might be wondering why do we he have to hear this from a 17 year old teenager. Uh, but believe me, it's exhausting to continue to pretend, be, to pretend being normal when you're internally having intense period cramps. It's exhausting to be dismissively told that you're suffering from that time of the month. Niagara Falls, strawberry season or bad luck. It's exhausting to continuously fight back against age old traditions that ask you not to pray, touch or visit temples. And the list goes on and on. Nearly 800 million people between the ages of 15 and 49 are menstruating right now. And yet, we are still not talking about it. Women have been menstruating for thousands of years. It's the reason you and I even exist. Yet, there's an element of shame associated with a woman's monthly cycle. Girls hardly open up about their periods to their father or brothers. The thought of judgment or rather shame takes over. If not at home, women at professional places are forced to believe that it is not normal to take care of themselves while they are menstruating, because it is how it is. But it cannot be denied that women are affected by periods. Nearly 25 million women suffer from a condition called endometriosis, a condition that makes period pain so bad that women may pass out from it. Nearly 20% of women suffer from menstrual symptoms like cramps, nausea, etc., which are debilitating enough to hamper daily activities. Now, menstruation being rarely discussed in schools or families, menarche often arrives to girls with little or no knowledge of what is happening. A research study by UNICEF showed that one in three girls in South Asia had no knowledge of their menstruation before their first period. Management of menstrual pain is a key concern, yet little sympathy is given to those alone facing this regular pain. In the UK, 80% of the women have been found suffering from menstrual symptoms like irregular or heavy bleeding, but had not consulted a health professional. 27% of them admitted that they found it too embarrassing to talk upon. The rooted silence surrounding menstruation is putting lives at risk, not only in India, but globally as well. Nearly one out of five girls drop out of school every year when their period starts, as they do not understand what they're going through. Basic menstrual hygiene is seen as a waste of money, even after fairness, creams and cosmetics. We, in the room here, are privileged enough to afford menstrual hygiene. But what about two-thirds of girls in rural India? What, are the, what about the struggles of homeless, transgender, displaced, and intersex people who menstruate? What about them? Moreover, sanitary napkins remain out of reach to a vast majority in India, as only 57% of the menstruators can afford it. Many of them end up resorting to unsafe materials to manage their periods, as their schools and workplaces don't yet provide free menstrual products. Well, do you know about the pink tax? It is a charge on menstrual products. In India, sanitary napkins were exempted from taxes after the applauding efforts of activists. 
But since the tax on the raw materials continues to be the same, consumers are very less benefited from it. Menstruation does not only affect a girl physically, but mentally too. Only for once, imagine yourself to be that young girl in the class who sees her skirt stain, who's afraid to approach for help. When girls are totally aware about their bodies, the facts, only then they can stand against the biased practices. We in the room here are educated enough to understand far more adverse consequences of not speaking upon the topic. But we prefer to stay silent. And why shouldn't we if menstruation is a women's issue? At the grassroots level, we perceive menstruation to be a women's issue. But decisions about how to care for menstruation are made by a selected few men. Even though this difference is an ironic disparity, we continue to see that men continue to contribute in decision making where menstrual management is concerned. Therefore, men and women need to be equally aware and clear in their understanding of what menstruation is so that women can work freely with pride and honor. Thus, participation of men is an important key to change, to empower men. Also, men understanding the pain which a woman goes through during menstruation will help to bring harmony in families, communities, and relationships. Will help to bring harmonies, uh, The first step towards normalization is to say the word period. Rather than referring it to as that time of the month, can't go into puja for a week or can't have pickles. Secondly, educate girls from the beginning about periods, period cramps, use of tampons, etc. But make sure that the discussion is about awareness for both boys and girls equally and not a red flag of shame and segregation. And third, we should stop associating periods with adolescence, uh, with adulthood, curse, sexuality, holy silence, or celebration. We should understand that periods is a basic normal body function. If we can speak, digestion, blood circulation, respiration, all natural biological processes normal, why should menstruation be off limits? India's legislative system has been fairly backward in introducing menstrual friendly policies, unlike the countries of Japan, Italy, etc., which provide menstrual leave to women every two to three days of the month. An Indian food delivery's decision to give 10 days of per year leave to women triggered a massive discussion about gender equality and menstruation, menstruation friendly policies in India. Now many corporate firms have come forward to speak and to give, provide women menstrual leaves. Imagine the smallest of schools in India, including menstrual education for the impressionable children of the 6th, 7th and 8th standards. Imagine teachers having healthy discussions on the topic where both boys and girls are equally aware. Imagine creating a generation that associates periods with strength rather than shame. So let's widen the mindsets, change the existing, and let's say periods aloud. Thank you. Thank you, Ria. May I request Mr. K. Mohanti, Director, Kangar Valley Academy, to fel felicitate Ria Jain. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. 
I would like to call upon Anand sir to have a brief session with Riya. Thank you so much, Riya, for touching upon such a pertinent topic, a topic that is often considered taboo, even today, as we progress into the world of social media in Indian society. I would like to ask you questions uh, that touch upon anecdotes from your own personal life. I'd like to ask you that when we talk about menstruation, when we talk about periods, when we talk about menstrual hygiene, how many of the boys around you, who you speak with, are genuinely informed about it? Um, most of the boys have the upper knowledge about menstruation, but like most of them do not actually understand what it is. Uh, I have been very privileged to come from a good section of society where my parents and like colleagues, my fellow mates and my teachers have been constantly supported. But this is like, as I said in my speech, this is not for most of us. For the rural girls in India and for intersex, displaced, and transgender people, it is very common, it is a very big problem. Even if like, we try to have a conversation, it will be difficult, because most of us would be uncomfortable to speak upon periods, which is a so biological, natural process. It's not even women's fault, and then also women are being blamed for it. So true, so true. So in fact, you know, uh, the concept of menstruation, I happen to, uh, study a little bit about what takes place in biology even across state textbooks in different languages. The concept of menstruation is covered. It's very much covered. I mean, menstruation is defined. We know it's menstruation if you have studied biology in grade 9, grade 10 for sure, in any board of education. Then why do you think, um, you know, that knowledge is not getting transferred? What needs to be done? Well, see, it's being covered in education. The main problem is people consider it as a taboo, right? Like you said. Mm -hmm. They do not feel comfortable to talk upon it mm -hmm. because of the age-old traditions that are continuously followed. But I believe that these should be, like, the theme of the TEDx this year is disruptions or transformations. Mm -hmm. I feel it is necessary to transform because we cannot continue to follow what is wrong. Mm -hmm. We have not been speaking about it, but I think it's the time to normalize it, to make it a part of our daily conversations. So true. Have you been making efforts to take this conversation forward as well? Yes, I have been a part of Global Shapers Intercontinental Boot Camp, where, I am, where me along with my teammates have been the, doing project on menstruation. We have been writing blogs, we have been continuously communicating with other people, and we are in the implementation phase of the project right now. You are associated with it. Yes. And the, we have been provided constant support from the school teachers, from principal sir, from you, and this feels great. Thank you so much. My intention was not to bring that to notice, but <laughs> it came up very inadvertently, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, anything that you'd like to uh, share with respect to the preparation for TEDx, your experience with TEDx, this platform that would motivate a lot of the parents as well, a lot of the adults, a lot of the teachers, and a lot of the students who are seated with us today. I think TEDx is a wonderful opportunity to actually come out of your comfort zone, like earlier mentioned in speeches. I think I have always wanted to do something different, speak different, or go in a different way. And I think I have been provided with this opportunity through the TEDx platform. Thank you so much, Ria. Big round of applause for her, please. Well done, Ria. And more power to you. Spread this word far and wide. Thank you, Anand sir and Ria, for such an amazing session. An urban designer, planner, strategist, and architect by profession, Eshna Prasad is deeply passionate and committed to addressing questions of urban resilience, sustainable development, and social equity, primarily through the lenses of affordable housing, infrastructure, critical conservation, and climate adaptation. She has recently graduated from Harvard University's Graduate School of Design with two master degrees, a Master of Architecture in Urban Design and a Master of Design Studies Ecologies 22, both with distinction. She is also the recipient of two prestigious awards, the Award for Outstanding Leadership in Urban Design and the Unsung Hero Prize 2022. 
As a self-described systems thinker, she continues to approach design as a tool for negotiation, experimentations, and transformation. She is an ardent believer that design has the agency to address urgent housing and climate justice challenges that are being brought on by rapid urbanization as well as economic and political transitions. In addition to urban planning and design, she is deeply interested in international development, urban policy, and advocacy work. In line with this, her work has been spread diver across diverse geographies such as Mumbai, Cape Town, Colombia, New York, Boston, and Rwanda. Apart from her professional and academic pursuits, Ashna has broadened her outlook and perspectives through various leadership positions and extracurricular activities. In 2020, she co-founded Sahayak, a social impact venture focused on developing a locational strategy for skill development aimed at tackling issues of mass migration while enabling satellite city development in India. Described by many as a natural leader, she has also served as Harvard Graduate Council Chair 22, Diversity and Inclusion Chair 21, as co-chair of South Asia Graduate School of Design 22, and as the editor of Urban Design Department's publication platform. After an extremely rich academic experience, Ashna has recently stepped back into the world of practice in her role as an urban designer at Sasaki. Through the work that she does across sectors, geographies, and scales here, she aims to have a tangible impact on the lives of many, on the myriad interconnected ecologies they inhabit, and most importantly, on the built fabric and larger frameworks that structures it globally. So here we have Ashna, Pride of Womanhood. Thank you so much for that introduction. Hello, everybody. As you might have gleaned from that introduction, I've spent over 10 years as a designer. I began my career as a designer as a student in Mumbai at the NMIMS School of Architecture. From there, I had the privilege of working with my mentor in a boutique interior and architecture design firm. Soon, I realized that my interests might be differing from what I'm doing. So I ended up taking a leap into Harvard as an urban designer. I added on a second degree, and now I find myself practicing as an urban designer at the firm named Sasaki, which looks to transform urban lives everywhere. However, when I had give, was given this opportunity to use this platform to spread something, I thought, why not talk about 10 things I learned as a designer I wish everyone knew? So even though my voice is a little sore, I'm going to try and get through all 10. Let's jump right in. The first thing that I learned as a designer that I wish everybody knew is how you think matters. Emphasis on how. The process matters. As a designer, you learn very early on that there is no single right solution. There are multiple approaches to a single problem. This means that when you walk into a design studio on the first day, your professor is going to give 80 students a single design problem. At the end of the semester, you will see 80 different problems, 80 different solutions to a single problem. Each of them are slightly different, yet similar. What this taught me is that it's not about which path you choose to create a solution. It's about how you argue for that solution. Deepak Malhotra, one of my favorite professors from the Harvard Business School, once said, people in this world are not looking for other people who have the right answers. What they're looking for is for people who can make compelling arguments. Today I ask you, can you, do you focus on making compelling arguments? Do you focus on the process that you're using to think? In addition to learning that there's no single approach to right answers, I also learned that design and life are both iterative processes. As designers, we learn very early on not to say no to ourselves. How many of you in this audience today have stopped yourself from expressing an idea, putting down something on paper, asking a question because you didn't think it was perfect? I'd, I'd bet that most of us over here have stopped ourselves from doing this. One of my closest professors once told me, Perfection is the enemy of the good. I think what he was also trying to say was that perfection is the enemy of creativity. As designers, we're, learned, we're taught to commit to ideas. What is in your head is not actually reality. We're taught to iterate. When you walk through a design studio, you'll see numerous models on people's desks. Some of them look similar to the one before them. Some of them absolutely different. Why this process matters is because it's not just a waste of time. It allows you to glean what information is failing and what is succeeding. All of that is then amalgamated into a proper design solution. 
Today I ask you to start looking at your life as an iterative process, which has multiple approaches towards success. The second point I'd like to talk about is engaging with chaos. When we do away with this illusion of perfection, we'll start to see the world as it really is. It's a complex system. It is messy. In a world where we're so used to getting information in tiny bite-sized pieces which are meant for consumption, as a designer, I have learned that in reality, the world is just simply complex. We have a saying in design sometimes, in the soup. When you're in the soup, you're sitting within that chaos. You're marinating in it almost. What we taught is to sit in it rather than run away from it. The more time you spend with all of the complexities, the more you'll realize that what often looks like that will soon begin to look like that. I remember when I was doing my design dissertation in my fifth year of architecture, my mentor Priyank Mehta told me, only from chaos can there be order. He was quoting Nietzsche, from chaos comes order. What these two men are trying to tell us is that if we want to reorder the world, if we want to evolve, rather than taking a simplistic path, we need to move beyond what you see as the tidy, facile world. The next point then is about the world. There is so much information in the world. There is so much knowledge production. When you don't have a set curriculum with a prescribed textbook, what design teaches you to do then is to focus on how you see the world, how you learn to know it. That, I think, is instrumental and important for everybody here today. It sounds easy, right? Hey, no textbooks. You don't have to write an examination. But what it forces you to do for information is to go out. It forces you to gather information, to assimilate information, to analyze information, and then to redeploy information. In this process, we often forget to ask, what are the sources that we're drawing upon? Citations become an afterthought, meant to be done at the end of a project. But why? I had the privilege of learning with Professor Abby Spinak, and she once told me, citations and knowledge production are both politics. Who you choose to quote and who you choose to learn from are very important choices especially when you're not given a set prescribed textbook. I, I want to stand here today and thank Abby for teaching me how to think, but also for giving me the ability to make this presentation this way. If then we start questioning what sources we are drawing upon to make design interventions or solutions for ourselves, we'll also realize that what we need to begin doing is di diversifying our perspective, diversifying the sources we are engaging with, there are so many contradicting opinions in the world. If you're only looking at the ones that agree with your perspective, you're not going to be able to grow. That is why I say what we consider information is important. Let me make a simple case. When you look at a cone, somebody might say they're seeing a circle. Someone else might say they're seeing a triangle. Neither of them are incorrect. They're just looking at it from different standpoints. We learn this very early in design. Perspective and perspective taking is important to understanding how you can respond to problems, how you can respond to challenges. I'm going to argue that not only is perspective taking important, but it's also important to question what we consider knowledge. I can say that my Harvard experience was shaped by the people that were sitting to my left, my right. Most of the people that I've quoted today, my professors, those were conversations I had with them over coffee. Codified knowledge is not the only form of knowledge. As designers, we're forced to go on to site to talk to people, to listen to what they're saying, but especially to what they're not saying. Silence is also data. Once we start looking at underlying information and knowledge, we'll be able to make more robust solutions. This is why I say diversify your perspective. Go beyond those books. Go to libraries. Go out. Go watch movies. It will enrich the way you start approaching different things. If you're okay with taking into consideration so many diverse perspectives, you'll also realize that the world does not work in binaries. Right and wrong, black and white, were mental frameworks that were given to us to make this complex world simpler. Like I said, the world is messy. But these frameworks are far too reductive and simplistic to be using even today. It's not about making qualitative judgments about things. I think what's more important is to recognize the differences that we're dealing with today. The main goal, I think, in design is to negotiate contradicting opinions and find creative ways to make them work together. I think that's pretty much life as well. If you stop looking at things that don't agree with you, if you think something is right and look away from it, 
it doesn't make it go away. So stop trying to make qualitative judgments. Instead, try to expand your worldview. And how we do this, how we deal with all of this information that I'm telling you to kind of assimilate, to work with, to allow into your space, is through our own mo internal moral compass. If you do away with this idea of binaries, I'm also asking you to do away with this need to be put in a box by other people's opinions, by other people's perspectives. You heard my resume a little bit earlier. I call myself an urban designer planner. I call myself an urban strategist. I call myself a systems thinker. Oftentimes, there's no job descriptions that look like that. People are too busy wanting you to fit into a certain perspective. You're left, you're right, you believe in certain things, you don't believe in certain things. That's what starts limiting us. Design taught me that if I have a moral internal compass based on everything that I have gleaned, I'm not only al allowed to break away from that box, I oftentimes expand it. I expand other people's perspectives with it too. So I ask you to stop letting them tell you what you are. In an extremely over-specialized world, I have learned that we need more specialized generalists. That's what I've begun defining myself as. Designers are an extreme demand today as people who can bridge the gaps between people who are only used to their own perspective. This brings me to my next question, my next lesson, which is frame intentional questions. When you're taking on so much altogether, everything boils, boils down to how you define the challenge that you want to take on. Words matter. I'm not saying there is right and wrong questions. Trust me, there isn't. Ask lots of questions. But are you being intentional about what you're asking? Are you thinking about the way you're framing it? How you frame it will define what response you get. Under thought out questions will always get underwhelming responses. If you're asking questions that have been asked before, you're gonna be chasing your tail or coming back with the same solutions. Don't do it. Think about questions that you would ask that are challenging but are still well framed and then can, can inform your modus operandi, which is how do you respond to it? A well-framed question will then allow you to engage with two very important design concepts that I'd like to present before you today. One is scope out scale. You have this huge problem that you've already started researching about. You've then zoomed into a small question that you'd like to answer. However, oftentimes we forget to position ourselves with respect to that question. Scale is about sphere of influence and sphere of concern. One of my very close mentors, Rahul Mirotra, was very worried one day when I was trying to take on the problems of the entire world as an urban designer. And so he asked me, Ishna, have you considered your sphere of concern and your sphere of influence? His simple statement helped me understand that what he's asking is what is my true agency given the position that I currently occupy? I'm a big adv advocate for a systems thinking approach, which means to look at the world with all its holes and relationships rather than splitting it into its parts. But I'm also a big advocate for positioning yourself within that system and asking, can you do what you want from where you are currently standing? As an urban designer, I cannot make policy changes. I would have to make a move for that. That is why every day in our lives, I think we should think about scale. Scale is a more tangible thing to wor work with though. What is intangible is time, even though it is one of the most important things. As designers, we often emphasize the importance of time, both in terms of time horizons and in terms of time periods. As children, we were often taught to draw a straight line as a timeline with exact constant intervals and looking like time worked in a single linear fashion. However, design taught me that line, time is not linear. Time is cyclical. Oftentimes, what we see in the past comes back. Time gets compressed based on innovation and technology, and sometimes it expands as well. What we then need to be okay with is to create correct checkpoints along the way. I ask, when you start thinking about solutions, when you pl start planning your life, do you think about the time constraints you have within which you're working? Do you think about the time periods within which you should look back again and see if your plan's working? Design makes you do that. As an urban designer, if I start designing something, I know that in 10 years the world will not be the same. And so I create a checkpoint for it. Today and every day in life, I'm asking you to think about time with time and through time. Not linearly, but oftentimes cyclically. Look at your past and rethink what you're looking for in the future. This will ensure that you go towards success. And that brings me to the question of 
how important it is to define your metrics for measuring success. Just like there's no single straight answer or a single solution, success doesn't look similar to everybody. What might be success for somebody sitting there is making a great painting. For you, it might be making a lot of money. For me, it might be looking healthy. All of these things are success in their own right. But why is it important to measure success? It's because that gives you a feedback loop. It allows you to check that your intervention is actually working. If you're looking at the wrong metrics, you're probably going to keep making wrong changes. And that's not going to help you get closer to success. So at the end of the day, if you define your metrics correctly at the correct dimensions, you'll probably make proper changes which allow you to get closer to success. I'm a designer, and we love setting out rules for ourselves. But more often than not, we also break them ourselves. That's because we want to be different. So I said I'd give you 10 takeaways, but today I'll leave you with an 11th. And for me, what design taught me is that we are every bit our aspirations for ourselves. What this means is that as designers, we're taught to be hopeless believers, not to be overwhelmed by the chaos that we welcome in, because we're given the tools to work through it. I was sitting at the Harvard Graduate School of Design in the Piper Auditorium when one of the greatest design thinkers, Rem Kulas, said, design without utopian ambition is a degraded profession. It really stood out to me. I still work with it every day. All I'm asking is that you continue to believe that even when things get tough, you have the ability to work through it. Sit in the soup with the tension, and you will start seeing the solutions. I'm telling you, I've lived dreams I didn't know I had for myself. I got opportunities I never dreamt of. And this was not all planned out. Trust me, with COVID and other things, all of my plans were thrown out of the window. But I started thinking like a designer. I took multiple different approaches. I tried things and failed as well. But today I stand here before you because I continue to believe. Believe in the hopeless optimism of design. That is why, as I leave you today, I'm going to leave you with a few other thoughts. Your thoughts matter. They may not be correct or incorrect. You may not feel like you know enough. You may think that you have incomplete information or there is too much more to learn, and so you shouldn't express your thoughts. But I'm going to tell you that even though I grapple with all of these issues, your thoughts matter. People value you for your thoughts. So long as you're working on your thought process, it's OK to be incorrect. Just go ahead and say what you're thinking anyway. You do not go it alone. I am standing here because of all the people that have nurtured me, supported me, mentored me, and taught me. I do not take that lightly. From the driver that drove me at 2 AM to get a laser cutting piece from a workshop, to the friend that brewed coffee for me at 2 AM. Value those connections. Listen to those people around you. Nurture them, and never be extractive with them. And third, and form, third but not last, get uncomfortable. When I left for Harvard University, I'd never actually left my house for a long period of time. When I reached there, my mother kept asking me, are you doing OK? Every time there was a problem, she was like, can I help you? And the one response I kept giving her is, I'll figure it out. After seeing me three years in flying colors later, she's been imploring me to write a book that says, I'll figure it out. And I told her, I'm not writing that book yet, because this cannot be the zenith of where I reach. Someday, maybe I'll do it. But what I will leave you with today is that you should get uncomfortable. Because if you remember to think like a designer, I promise you, I assure you, you too will figure it out. Not alone, with a little bit of help from everyone around you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashna. May I request Principal Sir to give the memento to Ashna. so much. And God bless you. I'm very happy that you came. Thank you so much for having me come. Thank you, sir. Now can we have Mr. Anush Prasad on the stage to have a brief session with Ashna. Well, Ashna, I was just thinking about it. I think we have been on stage since four, and all those years and hours of being on stage, I think it's the first time that both of us are on stage together. This is a special moment. She's my baby sister, actually. 
So uh, it's a special moment for me in addition to this. Uh, Eshna, great speech. Uh, what I'd really like to ask you is, uh, you talked about all of these things. I think there's another thing that we need to learn from designers, and I was thinking about it. Um, often you go with designs, you're an urban designer now, and you're working on this project, I believe, in Abu Dhabi, and yeah. you work on it, and there are so many different iterations of design that you need to keep providing to your clients. How is it that you convince them on what is right? Because most of the time, uh, I'm sure that whenever we are given a bunch of things, and we have so many different artists here, uh, you know, the client is never able to decide what is right, what is wrong. And this is the power of convincing, the power of persuasion, the power of explaining what you're doing is right. And I think that's a very important life skill, something that we can learn from designers as well. So how do you go about doing this and uh, convincing? Because most of the times the client doesn't know their mind, isn't it? No, definitely. You, 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 most of the times the client comes to you hoping that you give them both the problem and the solution. It's just a side and you, they don't know what they want. But I think, again, you're asking me how to convince them about what is right. What we usually do as designers is we first start asking them what their interests are, what their underlying position is. Do they want to maximize housing on a particular site? Do they want to make sure that there's more ecology? What is the objective of development of a certain site? Based on that, we start producing designs. Not only is the client's interest important, it's also us as designers. When I work on the Abu Dhabi project, my client is a developer. What he basically wants to do is maximize the profits he's going to make. I, as a designer, however, know how ecologically sensitive that site is. So we internally draw a red line, where we say we will not go beyond this amount of like uh, reduction of tree coverage. And every design that we present to him then is within that. He knows not better than to go beyond that. And that's how we start convincing him. All our solutions are based on where do we negotiate between these contradicting views. And, and I think then you start presenting designs in a certain way. I usually present the best design last. Because when you start with the best, they want more. So there, there's these small tricks that you start using for persuasion. You'll communicate lots of excitement for a bad idea, and you'll leave the idea that's really great with more questions. That way, when he has time to ask you, he's gonna start focusing on the one that you want him to. So there are certain strategies, but it's about negotiating those interests, really. As a famous person once said, all's well that ends well. So I guess that's important is what Ishna is saying as a designer. Another thing that I wanted to ask you, and I was thinking about this since I saw your speech as well, you talked about how we should stop thinking in binaries. Nothing ever is in zero or one. And while you or designers might appreciate this perspective and might be thinking and moving forward with this, well, a lot of people around the world still think in binaries. Yeah. So how does an individual who, who doesn't speak in binaries speak to an individual who thinks in binaries? I think that's a, that's a little bit of a difficult question, but it's almost asking, uh, you eat non-vegetarian, is that right or wrong? Mm -hmm. And right or wrong makes it a binary, right? It's a personal choice, it's as simple as that. It doesn't have to be black or white. And so if we can, we can process non-binaries in something like this, we can also process non-binaries in bigger questions. So I think it depends on the topic at hand, but non-binaries are simply, simply a way of thinking that that person may not agree with me, doesn't mean I need to make a qualitative judgment on that person. That, that's basically what thinking non-binary is. Mm -hmm. One last question before I go into uh, you know, the end credits. Um, I want to ask you, you talked about the process, the process of thinking really mattering, all right? We often talk about the means and the end, and we say the means are more important than the end and vice versa. Um, how do you ensure that the process leads to a satisfactory conclusion? I think that's where iteration comes into play because when you set out checkpoints at like say at five years, at 10 years, at 20 years, at 30 years from now, because those are the time horizons I work as with an urban design, like with as an urban designer, you start being able to check feedback. I've set out success as we need X amount of tree cover more, we need this many affordable houses. In five years, we do a check. If you know that you haven't reached that, something is not working. And so you start tweaking it. It's a constant iterative process, even in the real world. That's why you see construction is always happening. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's how we respond to like issues of process versus means and ends. Thank you so much, Ishna. Any words that you'd like to say for the TEDx platform, for our parents, for our students, a lot of them who would probably like to go to Harvard University as well. Any <laughs> words, especially with respect to the TEDx platform? Um, I think it's platforms like this w from which you learn the most. I was trying to convey that through the talk as well. They're looking for interesting personalities. They're looking for well-rounded personalities, but they're also looking for people who have 
really, really strong convictions. And I think this is a generation that's too busy trying to give people the right picture rather than arguing for what they truly believe in. So if there's one thing that I want to say is that using like pl platforms like this forces you to pick a subject that you truly believe in. It forces you to listen to other people's ideas and question whether you're as convictioned about them. And I think that's a lot of value for you as an individual. So when you go back home, maybe think about that. Not whether you're the perfect student, but whether you're the perfect version of a student that you want to be. Thank you so much, Aishna. I think you have done mom and dad very proud. Everyone Thank actually. you, Aishna. Thanks. Anand, sir, can I request you to please speak a few inspiring words to us? I think I've gotten a lot of footage today, very honestly. Uh, I've come on stage 10 times. And an 11th time, if you count that one period when I engaged the last audience. So I'm not going to take too much more footage. I think Aishna summed it up brilliantly. Uh, well begun is half done, as they say. And we had a brilliant set of speakers in the first half of today's session. We had four brilliant speakers who shared ideas related to varied things, right from Abhishek Patnaik all the way from Mumbai, coming and talking about how uh, to change your passion into a sustainable profession. He talked about theater. We had a few other students talking about uh, you know, the entire concept of comfort zones in different ways. We had somebody talking about mental health. Uh, in the second phase, we had some very august speakers in themselves talking about you know, different journeys, uh, the importance and the strength of words, uh, what design teaches us, what different professions teach us. We had uh, children who were speaking to us about comfort zones, menstrual hygiene, a very important topic as well. So we have covered an MBA and is now trying to help students in the field of education in India. We had a wonderful producer and talented actor in Abhishek. And of course, finally, we also had Abhay Kumar Singh, sir, who actually works with the income tax department and is such a wonderful student of literature and believes in the strength of words. So we have had such a diverse set of four individuals sharing ideas. If you'd really like to make the most of this opportunity, all you need to do today is reflect on the different speeches that you have heard. But more than that, try and come up with an idea. Okay? Try and come up with an idea that you believe is worth spreading. Okay? Don't think of the speech around it. Think of the idea worth spreading, spread it, and then come back. I was having a word with Amitav sir as well, and we were talking about how to expand the community and the carnival of ideas. Sir has come up with some brilliant ideas which I'm sure will be implemented in the coming years. So all of you students, focus on your ideas worth spreading, all right? Think of ideas, spread the ideas, and most importantly, I think you need to be the idea worth spreading. So that's all I'd like to say. Thank you so much. I promise you're done with me. <laughs> Thank you, Anand, sir. Now, may I call upon my classmate Nishika Tharani to present the vote of thanks. Good evening, everyone. Gratitude is not only the greatest of virtues, but the parent of all the others. With regard to this line, I, Nishika Tharani, stand before you to extend my vote of thanks on behalf of Bhatia Vidya Bhavan's Arkesada Vidya Mandir, Raipur. It has been such an honor to be a part of this wonderful event. First and foremost, my gratitude goes to the all-powerful for giving us the ability to conduct this humongous event. Then, to begin with, I would like to extend my heartiest gratitude to our wonderful speakers for enlightening us with their inspiring ideas. It was a golden opportunity for each one of us to be able to attend this session and learn a lot from each one of you. Furthermore, a special thanks to our esteemed guests and dignitaries present here for sparing some time from their busiest schedule to grace this occasion. Your presence meant a lot to us. We hope that we have made the best of it. Our sincere thanks goes to the management committee of Mac College for their support to make this event successful and for being cooperative throughout the time. I'm immensely thankful to our principal sir, Mr. Amitav Ghosh, for giving us this opportunity and supporting us to make this event happen. He has not only given importance to academics, but has always also encouraged us to evolve as a better human being. He has always been instrumental in molding the complex fears for his learners. We also extend our sincere thanks to Mr. Ananj Prasad for being the backbone of the program. With a deep sense of appreciation, we thank our loving teachers for being the catalysts that stimulated us to do our best and stood as our pillars of strength. 
Thank you for holding our hands, opening our minds, and guiding us throughout this event. We really appreciate your untiring efforts from the depth of our hearts. Not to forget, we have been fortunate enough to be backed by a team of very dedicated supporting staff who are well versed in their jobs. So, a special thanks to the staff of the college as well as of our school who worked behind the scene wholeheartedly to make this event flourish. In drawing things to a close, I would be failing my duty if I did not thank my fellow mates who have made this day possible and turned it into a memorable one. Ultimately, I would like to thank all of you present here for taking out the time to be with us today, blessing us with your presence, and helping us make this event a grand success. Thank you one and all. Now, with all your respect, may I request everyone to stand for the national anthem. Yeah. 